very good afternoon. We are about to start. So please take your seats. And let me introduce the Minister of Culture of Czech Republic, Mr. Lubomir Zaoralek, who will introduce our debate. Please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, allow me to welcome all of you, but uh, first of all, I would like also to welcome our dear guests. I see Colin Crouch from United Kingdom, Amber B. Jody Dean from New York, and uh, Boris Budin. I maybe, uh, yeah, Boris Budin is here, so, so, so. <laughs> Mr. Stef oh. Stephanie, Mr. Stephanie Griffith Jones, Pavel Barsha, and many others. I thank you very much for coming uh, here to, to Prague and to help us to commemorate uh, uh, our big anniversary, uh, the 30 years of Velvet, Velvet Revolution. Uh, in a few days, probably we will, we will, uh, uh, we will continue this uh, commemoration and celebration. And uh, I'm glad that we accepted this invitation to help us a little bit uh, to make reflection of not only these uh, years, 30 years ago, but uh, this whole period. Because I'm convinced that we need uh, uh, this re reflection and we need to think about these events also which happened 30 years ago. Why? Because there are many approaches. I know Mr. Drulak said that it was not revolution. There were too much negotiation during these days. There was no clash between communist party and dissent, much more negotiations. That is maybe the big, big question is what, what really happened in, this, uh, in these days uh, 30 years ago. And, uh, but uh, in Czech Republic, especially in Czech Republic, we can speak about something close to revolution. I know that in many in Yugoslavia, in Poland, was a different situation, but in Hungary, Czech Republic, so is Germany, we can speak about a revolution. And uh, because uh, demonstrations filled the streets and squares with the hundreds of thousands of people calling for change. And uh, I remember that during these days, we were convinced that something is fundamentally changing. I have concrete experience and memories on these days. And uh, that's why I would like to start uh, with these uh, uh, memories and with these uh, feelings 30 years ago. And uh, I'm speaking about change and I, I try also to look in some dictionaries as Britannica. And if you look to these dictionaries, you will find that revolution means many things, but the essential part of the definition is that something new begins. Take an example of French Revolution. The new calendar was established and uh, year one execution of the King Lou Capet, as French, as France, French revolutions called him, the new metric system was established and the Bolshevik Revolution, abolishing of the ranks in the Red Army. A revolution, it is always a time of newcomers, homines novi. And from the very beginning, the Velvet Revolution was in Czech Republic, was experienced by the citizen in similarly radical way, as something totally new. It was also my feeling, something really extraordinary, something absolutely different from the communist past. I had big, great feeling of discontinuity. I know that well, but the revolution was also romanticized, surrounded by pathos, and people accepted the language of dissent very quickly. Radical novelty, pathos, romanticization, in other words, radical discontinuity with communist past, were absolutely 
okay at the beginning of the post-communism era. But now, 30 years after the fall of communist political regime, it is not the time, my question is, if it is not the time for a new, sober approach and view. It does not mean that we should take the ironic view or tragic view. Absolutely not. We should really celebrate the Velvet Revolution. We should be happy. We should commemorate it. We should be proud of our liberation. The new approach means something very different. Look at the recent Czech historiography. The, back, the best Czech historians of the younger generation, as Michal Kopeček, Vítězslav Sommer, Matej Spurny, etc., do not put emphasis on discontinuity, but on the contrary, on continuity. Continuity before 1989 and after 1989. More generally, the more we explore every dayness, every dayness, the more blurred is the line between the political systems of the past and today. I think that this type of research brings the most interesting results, not because it doubts the revolution, it was fundamental change, as I said, and these historians do not cast any doubts on it, but I believe the more we are able to realize the continuities, the more we can appreciate the discontinuities. Once more, it does not mean that we should reject the Velvet Revolution. It's not that 30 years long enough to be able to view our past in more nuanced and I hope more mature light. If we talk about the growing up children's metaphor, I would say that Boris Budden, one of the guests at this conference, wrote an excellent book in Czech. It was published under the name Konec Postkomunismu, the end of postcommunism. And he says that the vocabulary of the post-communist transformation is burdened by peculiar metaphors such as our democracy still wears nappies, our democracy suffers from children diseases, etc. And it claims that it is really scandalous that people who were able to carry out something as important as revolution in 1989 were suddenly transformed into small children who must learn, they must learn from the best, their democracy still wears the nappies. I would add we are still post-revolutionary children, also in, under, in another respect. We are still too theoretical, we romanticize the revolution too much, we are too sensitive about it, we are too touchy, we are quibbling, we look at, every, we look, we look at everybody who tries to apply a more objective approach as to someone who smashes our toys. In other words, we are really immature, fearful, and it does not make us good in many respects. Take into consideration the phenomenon of nostalgia. Nostalgia does not mean that people do want to return to the communist past. Nostalgia means that people lack something in their present lives. We might take this seriously. We should not blame people with a nostalgic sentiment for wanting the coming back to communism. We should try to understand what the reason is for their today's dissatisfaction. Maybe it is the time today, 30 years after the Velvet Revolution, to grow up and bear the view on something unpleasant. I believe we should be mature enough to be able to celebrate the Velvet Revolution as grown-ups. I hope we do not need any unnecessary support. I wish you interesting discussion. Welcome once again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Minister, for your speech. I think you actually greatly facilitated my task because actually you introduced some of our speakers. Uh, but still, uh, let me say a few words uh, concerning the first debate. Because we will have two, two debates and the first debate um, will be focused on the question uh, 
of the links between 1989 and 2019, between where we are now and what happened then. And if we compare, uh, it's, I mean, we are confronted with a mixed picture. Because on the one hand, we can see that many of the expectations of, 1919, uh, of 1989 were fulfilled, more than fulfilled. At that time, we talked about democracy, market, prosperity, democracy, human rights, Europe. All these things were actually in the minds of the people in the streets in 1989. And most of these things were achieved. We are a democratic country. We have human rights protection with Western standards, I would say. There is a reasonable prosperity in Czech Republic. And Europe, indeed, well, we are in Europe. We are in the European Union, we are in the NATO, we are in all these institutions which represented Europe to all of us. So there is uh, some ground for satisfaction. At the same time, there is a deep um, dissatisfaction the minister talked about. There is some sort of disappointment. And this disappointment is both inside the region when I say we, I don't say just we Czechs, I speak about well, Central Europe. So there is dis disappointment inside the region, because yeah, we talked about market, but uh, well, we discovered capitalism. Uh, we, talked about, um, we talked about Europe, we discovered the European Union, which is more ambiguous than Europe. Europe is only positive, European Union is a more, much more complicated beast. We talked about civil society. We have NGOs, it's also different because the spirit of civil society and the reality of NGOs are two different things. And many other things, many other things. So here inside Central Europe, there is actually a lot of questions which are posed about uh, what we actually achieved. Did we want really to have this? There is also some sort of concerns outside the Central Europe. Many people are asking, uh, the questions about what's going on here, where are people like Václav Havel and the great democratic leaders, did they disappear, how come? I mean, some people in the West are disappointed that our politicians are so like their own politicians. I mean, because they were used to some spiritual leaders and they thought that, I mean, the Central European politicians should bring uh, messages of hope, love, I don't know what else. Unlike, unlike their democratically elected leaders. And now they see that, I mean, the, the, the democratically elected leaders in Central Europe are actually are not that much different from their own democratic leaders. Sometimes they, 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 can have, they can make speeches which are considered as brutal and which, uh, which, uh, which for many of them raise, again, a number of questions. So this is this mixture. We have a lot, there is success, which I think is um, without any doubts. There are no doubts about the success of Central Europe, but there are also deep disappointments inside, outside. So in this respect, I'm happy that we will have now opportunity to look at um, these developments, at these evolutions from three very different perspectives. Because uh, we will start with Stephanie Griffiths-Jones. Stephanie Griffiths-Jones is economist. She grew up in Chile but she is, she is of Czech origin and uh, she is associated with prestigious institutions of e economic research. Today it's Columbia, Columbia University, but you live in London. Uh, Stefani did a lot of research on international, um, international capital markets and uh, with a focus on national development and development banks with respect to capital markets. So she will, she will give us perspective concerning, uh, you know, she, will give, she will give us an economic perspective of the, of the tra transformation. Then we will have, we have, we have Boris Buden. I think I, I don't have much to add to what Minister Zaoralek said, because also for me, when I read the book, um, uh, I, I will just say that Mr. Buden is from Croatia, but you also work in Germany, so you have close contacts uh, with, um, with, with German intellectual and academic scene. And your book, which has been tra translated into several languages, including Czech, about post-communism, post is a remarkable book, I think. I, I, I can only recommend it to everyone to read it. And uh, the thing which I also, for me, was very important, was important message was about this image of, uh, of children. 
I mean, the, the, the construction of Central Eastern Europe as children, and we will talk about it. Uh, we will talk about it later. So that's Mr. Buden. I think your original discipline, your culture critique, can, can we say so, or uh, uh, philosopher culture? I, st I studied philosophy in Zagreb, uh, yeah. in, in Croatia, with the Praxis philosophers, and then I uh, did my PhD at Humboldt on, uh, yeah. in Kulturwissenschaften, yeah, yeah. so which is cultural theory. Culture theory, culture theory is the thing. Uh, last but not least, we have Pavel Barsha here. I'm not sure whether it's actually necessary to introduce Pavel Barsha because he's well known in Czechia, he's well known in docs. I, it's, it's not the first time you are here. Um, uh, Pavel Barsha is a public intellectual in Czech Republic, political philosopher, uh, some, would say poli some would say philosopher, some political scientist, for me you are a political philosopher. Um, with a number of books, number of books, a uh, number of media appearances. Uh, your latest book about um, emancipation is remarkable. There is a remarkable, uh, I would say, unorthodox, unorthodox interpretation of Václav Havel. But there is, uh, there is a number of other books which, which Pavel, which Pavel have written thr throughout his fruitful, fruitful career. So, so much for the introduction. We agreed with our guests that they will not have long uh, speeches. Each of them uh, will have five minutes, five minutes reacting uh, to the questions which pertain to his field. Then, and then we will have reactions. Then we will have reactions also with the audience. So from the very start, please be prepared to think about the questions and comments you will have uh, you will have to the guests because we would like actually to engage the audience from the from the very very beginning so let me start uh, let me start with uh, stefani i mean the economic transformation was unprecedented many of the decisions which were taken were taken without any previous guidance because that was not possible what uh, how do you evaluate these de decisions what would you say turned right what turned wrong there were i mean inevitable decisions about privatization about foreign capitals about inequality i mean that was not decided that we should have inequality but that was taken that was from the very beginning taken as something which uh, will be part of the process because the equality which we had under uh, under the centrally planned system was artificial and and it was obvious that with the markets, uh, uh, inequality will increase, which is to some extent beneficial, but uh, the uh, passing certain point may be a problem. So, in brief, uh, how would you uh, how would you uh, how would you evaluate the key decisions of the, of the transformation, and uh, link them with the situations we are uh, we are in today? Thank you very much. Uh, I thank you very much for the invitation. I'm very honored to be here on such a distinguished panel and with the minister pr uh, presiding over it. Um, I would like to um, say also apologize because I haven't been following the Czech Republic closely, although I did work quite, quite significantly here in the time uh, after the Velvet Revolution both as advisor and, and doing research projects. And we have two books with Czech colleagues published. So uh, my knowledge is more from the, if you like, from the initial period. Um, so I would like to start uh, by saying that uh, in terms of, I will say one thing about um, politics, which is not my field, that if I think somebody came here from the Middle East, or perhaps even from Brazil, they would be deeply jealous of the success of uh, the political transition to democracy here. Because you don't have somebody like Bolsonaro as a president and you don't have the chaos that is prevalent in many uh, Middle East countries. So I think, you know, maybe sometimes people in their own country uh, don't, and I see it also in the country where I grew up, don't appreciate the relative successes. And I think an international perspective is therefore very, very important. So from the economic point of view, I think major changes were done, really major, because the, the Czech economy, Czechoslovak economy then was very, very strongly in state hands, much more than other countries. And it made a dramatic transformation transformation to private economy, 
the, the markets to which the Czechoslovakia exported were totally in the Soviet bloc, and you made a major transformation towards particularly Western Europe. And on top of that, the country was split. But in spite of that, all these things happened without major disruption and with fairly good growth. So I looked at the data. Since 1989 till today, GDP per capita in this country has grown by 75%, which is really quite remarkable. It is more than the Eurozone, which has grown less than 40%, although many of us criticize the policies of the Eurozone. But it's more than the Eurozone, it's higher than Hungary, and it's only been overtaken by Poland, which has been highly successful and has grown much more, practically double. So I, I think that this is a big, big achievement, because it implies behind it that, on average, people's living standards have increased very significantly. I think looking forward, I think a, an interesting issue is to ask, for example, can this growth be sustained? For example, the Czech Republic invests very little in research and development. So can you sustain a, a rapid growth if you're not investing as much as, for example, the Asian economies, the Koreas, the Chinas, uh, and so on? And how can you continue growing in this very complex international economic environment of trade wars and so on? But Looking, continuing to look towards the past, I want to focus on the issue that Petra uh, raised about income distribution. So I looked at the data. Uh, I think that it is very clear that income distribution in this country has deteriorated. Uh, that it deteriorated particularly during the early 90s when the major transformations were happening. But in comparative perspective with other countries, particularly in Central and Eastern Europe and Russia, the deterioration was very moderate. It was moderate. So I think this is, this is important. So if we look at the top 1%, which has become very fashionable to look at, it, they had about 16% in the first half of the 20th century. They were compressed to about 3% in the communist period. But now, in recent years, they've gone up to 10%. So it's still much less than it was in the pre-war period, pre-Second World War, but it's tripled, if you like, compared to the communist period. And this is related to both wage dispersion and in increased concentration of private capital. Uh, there was a jump, not just in the 1%, but in the top decile in the early 90s, and privatization, which you also mentioned, particularly voucher privatization, which was speedy, big bang, uh, created an impulse towards greater concentration of wealth. But partly this was mitigated because the social policies protected the relatively poorer parts of society. And the preservation of the welfare system after the transition, um, although there were, of course, some cutbacks, has defended the poorest people. But after this voucher privatization, which, of course, enriched a lot of people in the Czech Republic, there also came a very major influx of foreign capital. And it was these foreign companies and their owners who are capturing a lot of the wealth in the Czech Republic. So it's, it's the combination of privatization and foreign ownership. But I want to add a little bit about comparing uh, what the top 1% have, sorry, top 10% have in the Czech Republic compared to other countries. So in 1990, the top 10% had 20% of total income. In 2015, it had 30%. So in 15 years, they went up by half. In Poland, it went up from 22% to 40%, already more. But in Russia, it went from 24 to 45%. So you have you know, an increase which is important for the rich here, but not as big as in Russia. And perhaps more interesting uh, is that the, the bottom 50% um, actually maintain their share better here. 
They went down only by five points, the bottom 50%. The people who are relatively poor went down from 34 to 29, which is bad, but it's not awful. Whereas in Russia, they went from 30 to 18. Yeah, so almost half. And in Poland, they're sort of in between, from 30 to 24%. So you would get middle of the class marks, if you like. So I think it's important to, to, to point to this. I think it is too much, and that there should be, but I'm not sure we have time in this intervention. Um, there are a number of policies which I think can, can be followed to, to, to improve income distribution, but, uh, but I think we have to keep this perspective uh, of, of saying, you know, it, it, it could be worse. It's not a big consolation for somebody who's very poor to know that it could be worse, but I think we need to have this international perspective. Thanks a lot. You know, we Czechs tend to be quite pessimistic. So if someone tells us it could be worse, it's actually a very good message. Uh, it's like message of joy. <laughs> Boris, you use this powerful metaphor of infantilization. So perhaps could you explain it a bit more? Maybe for those who didn't, uh, who has not read, uh, who have not read uh, your book, what is, and what is its? Imp do you, do you still feel that it has? It's alive. That it impacts on what's going on today. That's my first question. And the second question is, you know, when I read your book, I had the impression uh, as if, you know, this role of kids, of children, was somehow dictated. But what I uh, learned, for what, I, what I remember from my experience, it was, always, it was very often self-chosen. So it was a role which the people gladly accepted, actually, to be like, li like kids. I just wonder whether it's also your analysis or if you could tell us more about this important phenomenon. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Uh, uh, the, question, the question was whether people still feel like a children or, or as uh, Mr. Minister said, the, or uh, they have grown up. Uh, the subtitle of my book is The End of Post-Communism, which already 10 years ago, my, I claimed that it is over. The ideology of the post-communist transition has exhausted its tautology, its uh, you know, perspective, goal. It has lost the future. For me, 10, 10 years ago, I'm, I still so the, the this... Uh, Post, uh, the, the jargon of the post-communist transition used massively these phrases like first steps of democracy, till, uh, uh, infantile uh, illnesses of democracy, in the nappies, exams of democracy, etc., etc. But it was interesting. This, this was obviously a certain figure ideolo with uh, ideological function, uh, several ideological functions. Uh, the first was to create something absolutely <laughs> innocent. You know, child is innocent. Child is not responsible for, for what it, it, it does. Uh, and this is some sort of, you know, ground zero of society on which you can restart uh, new, new social, let's say, social, conclude new social contract. And uh, it created this uh, feeling of a radical break, of a rupture, of a difference between, uh, difference between the past and the Something, something new. Um, I'm very, very much. Um, I, I'm glad to, to hear that that the, the young uh, uh, Czech historians emphasize more continuities than the break, be, because this is precisely what would be my point, and this is precisely this turn now that we should we should start to think. Of, of these continuities. I'm just like leaving what I have prepared because I find it so interesting also about your, your uh, uh, introduction, which is very much focused on the Central Europe with this difference between uh, like uh, the former Soviet Union or more precisely uh, uh, Russia. I, I give you uh, one anecdote. Uh, 1990 in Belgrade, in a bookstore, Jeffrey Sachs, was, was there, and then Branko Milanovic, who is uh, now quite famous on, with his book on, uh, on uh, inequality, etc. And they met in the bookstore, and uh, Jeff, Jeffrey Sachs asked, oh, uh, how nice, 
would, uh, would you like to sign my book? It was translated at the daytime. Would you like to sign? And he signed and he, uh, for, uh, he wrote for Jeff who tries to save socialism. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, uh, Sachs answered, no, I'm not trying to save socialism, I'm trying to bury, to bury socialism. But it was, you know, now um, there were later books written about neoliberal elements in the socialism. This, uh, especially in, in former, former Yugoslavia, this is, uh, and just to cut it, I'm now improvising because I think it is, it is extremely interesting. I'm so, um, I have never expected that my book will, uh, will be so welcomed in Czech Republic because I thought this is such a success perfect story in comparison to the catastrophe of uh, former Yugoslavia. You know, living standard, uh, the, the, the level is uh, the end of the 70s now in, uh, in Croatia, which is completely destroyed. But uh, then we come to the continuities, we come to the, to, the, uh, to the idea of this break, which created these clear dichotomies. You know, we have uh, state ownership, private ownership, central planning, laissez-faire, market economy. Yugoslavia was the case of a socialist market economy. It was the case of uh, neither private nor state property. 1990, there is no state property. Not a factory, not a, ho not, not, uh, uh, a, a hotel was a state property. So the first step of privatization was etatization. They declared everything state pro property. They had to change the law because the workers were uh, 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 juridically owners of, 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 of the factories. But not only that, you know, on the whole level, if I would, you know, we call it Velvet uh, Revolution and you land in Prague on the, the airport Václav Havel. And I know how important is this figure of, of dissident. Uh, and I. Never, I, I even claimed, I was in a Sakharov center two weeks ago in Moscow, and I claimed in former Yugoslavia there are no dissidents. And even if I would talk about myself as being a dissident, which means, you know, clash with the secret police, being punished in the army, more probably Kundera than Solzhenitsyn, but anyway, then uh, if I would then ask, what was the stake? What was the clash? The clash was the, the beginning of the 80s, the commodification of education. Because education was financed not by the state, but by the complex uh, unities of uh, uh, production subjects who would have special interests in certain knowledges, which concretely for the uh, Faculty of Philosophy in Zagreb meant they had interest in foreign languages, not Russian, of course, because no tourists come, came from Russia, but English, German, French, etc. Et, et so they started to cut, I studied philosophy, uh, uh, philosophy, sociology, etc. And we protested. We protested against, against what we call now commodification of, 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 of education. It was my first clash with neoliberal transformations at that time, which is the end of the 70s. So, and then the whole history of Yugoslavia that uh, already uh, in the 50s became member of uh, IMF, uh, of, of World Bank, etc. This is a huge, completely different, different history. And I wrote a book about the end of post-communist transition, but in fact, in former Yugoslavia, there was no post-communist transition. It immediately ended. In, 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 in the catastrophe. And uh, speaking, you know, this picture of uh, uh, communism, uh, gray, people queuing for basic goods. Yes, this was the case in Yugoslavia, but only in the 80s, after the intervention of uh, IMF, uh, that imposed, imposed austerity measures, like in Greece, and uh, they put so much pressure on the, on the uh, uh, communists, <laughs> communists to freeze, to freeze the wages. But they, they, were, they were telling them, but sorry, it's a market, we cannot freeze the wages. But they were, by the international capital, put under pressure to do it. And uh, 
before, during these austerity measures, the living standard fell uh, during the 80s 40% in, in, in former Yugoslavia as a result. Despite of that, the state was able to finally pay uh, to, uh, back the, the debt, and uh, it collapses in the moment of economic recovery, which is uh, uh, with the currency, everything. This is not, you know, completely different, different story. Uh, and I have some, you know, uh, I can, we can discuss it uh, later, but I just... Yeah, just, uh, just uh, uh, wanted to, to give you some sort of uh, uh, a different story uh, which puts in question this idea of a common historical experience. Whether do we have saying this is communism or, or post-communism. I just, just to remind you, in the Central Committee of the Yugoslav Communist Party, already in uh, 1950, they defined Soviet system as, I quote, a type of state monopoly capitalism worse than the Western one. So what was communism, capitalism? It's completely, completely different and open. I'm just, yeah, now close and then we can speak. Thank you. Uh, Boris talked about this issue of the break and continuity, and we can, we can actually raise this question with respect to communism and post-communism, but we can also raise this question with respect to the evolution within the, say, post-communism. And many people actually now live or actually are convinced that there is actually a big contrast between the 19, early 1990s with the sort of some ethical um, approach to politics, ideas of civ civic society, civic, uh, civic citizenship, universalism. All these ideas were actually somehow mobilized in Central Europe and they helped us actually to, 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 to join the European Union. Now Central Europe is often associated with different ideas, with nationalism, uh, populism, that's what the critics say, uh, fairly or unfairly. Um, so. I, I just wonder, and I would like to ask Pavel about it. Uh, so, first of all, do you see that there was such an evolution? Do you see there is uh, some uh, breaking point between the early 1990s and today uh, with respect to these ideas and ideologies? Yes, uh, this usually the breaking point is uh, identified as 2015, basically 2015 refugee crisis. Um, the Visegrad countries uh, basically taking the uh, critical, uh, you know, the position against the uh, positive approach to the refugee flow. And this is taken as a, as a U-turn, uh, I think, in the mainstream opinion, in both here in Central Europe and in Western Europe. Um, also by uh, the main protagonists of this U-turn, like Kaczynski or Orban, less so in the, in the Czech Republic, uh, because, and they actually say, they interpret this U-turn as a completion of the 90, 1989 revolution, okay? Uh, paradoxically, from the point of view, from the liberal point of view, because the liberals tend to see it in the opposite way, right? and to say, well, this is exactly the opposite of what we fought for in 1989. So, who is right and who is wrong? I think um, uh, the, uh, if we look at the legacy of 1989, we will find out very quickly that it's not really monolithic. Of course, at first you see what you mentioned. You see this liberal democratic uh, human rights facade. But it's a larger framework under which you have other things, like, for instance, nationalism, uh, national, nationalist aspirations against the Soviet empire and Soviet bloc. Uh, you have a strong uh, stress on self-determination, you know, regaining sovereignty after 40 years of being colony of, of Euro-Asiatic empire, right? You have also uh, ident identitarian uh, aspect. Uh, in the 80s, uh, something which we can call the discourse of Central Europe, uh, 
the world in this part. And I'm now speaking basically on the Visegrad countries, not really about the Southeast Europe, because I think it's really different. The history is different. Uh, and uh, so the idea was in the 80s, of course, and uh, Milan Kundera was famous, famously claiming in his uh, essay, Kidnapped, uh, Kidnapped West, uh, that uh, culturally speaking, we belong to the West, but we were, we have been colonized by, by the Eastern Empire, <laughs> so we want to liberate ourselves. That was there as well. It was very particularistic. It was not really like, you know, it was not, it was complementary to human rights discourse. Human rights discourse was universalistic, individualistic, uh, uh, and, but then there was this complement to that, which was quite particularistic, both on the level of region, we are European, we belong to the West according to our history and culture, we have been colonized, but also in national terms. In some countries it was more palpable than in others, of course, in Poland uh, it was more palpable than in Czech Republic, for instance, in Slovakia it was again more palpable. Uh, and it led eventually to the split of uh, Czechoslovakia, but the national aspirations were there, you know. So we can say that uh, the legacy is not monolithic, it's rather composite, even though 30 years ago, of course, this liberal side prevailed. It was those uh, particularistic nationalist, culturalist, identitarian elements were subordinated to a larger framework. Um, and we, of course, were happy in comparison to Yugoslavia because uh, World War II, uh, due to the World War II, we were homogeneous, most of those countries, so especially Poland and Czechoslovakia, uh, uh, got rid of its minorities. So that meant that we could really concentrate on the liberal, democratic and uh, market issues, uh, while uh, your country, of course, was in the opposite, uh, in the opposite situation. It should first to tackle the national issue, and uh, so sub-societies of Yugoslavia are fighting for their own nation states, and only after that <laughs> they could try to become also liberal. Uh, but uh, so that was, I think, one. Uh, uh, what what happened in, uh, and I think uh, Jacques Rupnik, uh, uh, one year ago, I think he wrote an article in, in uh, Journal of Democracy when he claimed that uh, those three liberal uh, aims: uh, return to Europe, market uh, economy, liberal democracy. <laughs> Uh, were more or less achieved in the 2000s. And uh, somebody said here that there was no future to this project anymore because it was, uh, the promised land was leached. And we found out in the meantime that it's not promised land which we imagined, right? And it got in troubles itself. All three, all three aims got in troubles in the West as well. So we got in the situation that this kind of platform <coughs> couldn't really uh, serve as a roadmap <laughs> for the future. And the 2015 uh, conjuncture allowed the opposite values, which were there, subordinated to liberal values, to become autonomous. And Kaczynski and Orban were actually saying, now, only now we have completed the journey, exactly because we stopped, we are, we stopped being pupils of those teachers there. Right? We became autonomous uh, actors. Now we say that we don't want our refugees on our territory, even if in the Brussels they don't like that. But we are not pupils anymore. <laughs> right? We are autonomous actors. Uh, at the same time, they redefined the uh, Central European uh, discourse. They would use the, the, the formal I, I think the formal structure is very similar to Kundera structure, but they redefined the whole thing. While Kundera was saying we actually belong to the West, and not only that we belong to the West, but West actually got commercialized, Western culture is in decline, and we actually can save the West from its own commercialization. That's what he hints at in this article. Kaczynski and Orban is saying something very similar, but with different content. Okay, we are part of the Europe, 
23 uh, years ago, Orban said something like this. He said, Three, uh, 27 years ago, we thought that we saw in Europe our future. Now we think, after 2015, now we think we are the future of Europe. Okay? We will save Europe from itself. Okay? Uh, meaning we will self Euro from liberal multiculturalism, acceptance of refugees and so on and so forth, because we understand that this is something which endangers our European Western culture. So I think this is what, what happened. Both sides, both liberals and nationalists can claim the legacy of 89. Well, thank you. Well, I think just developing what you said, I'm not sure whether actually anyone in the political elite shared, I mean, the pure universalist project. Because if you look at the Czech debate, you have Havel, and Havel had actually, I mean, uh, the structure of his argument was very similar to what you described. So there was actually quite clear um, direction to the West with the idea that we, there are several things we can teach to the West. Saying that we have a unique experience with communism, which gives us special insight into human rights, civil society. And the same with Klaus, huh? because of capitalism, because we are actually much more, uh, we, we, we are much more committed to economic freedom, which is incorporated by free capitalism. And again, the West was actually without any doubts for all, for all of them, I mean, like the, uh, like the beacon to be followed. And that's actually my question to all of you. Now, actually, because that was, uh, I mean, we had uh, like a clear goal, Central Europe. And that was the West. That was uh, because the West was tangible. Uh, and in politics, you need to have tangible goals. So that was the Western prosperity. That was the Western institutions. That was the Western products. All these things were visible. So when the, when the, when the, when the politicians went to the people uh, and people asking what is, uh, what is uh, your program, they said, well, I would like that you have the, as good lives as people in the West. And that was basically the message of everyone. And so that's why the West was so important. But today, and actually you hinted at it, the West can no longer play such a role here in Central Europe. So what does it mean for us? Does it mean that we have to, we have to turn elsewhere? Or, which is probably the worst thing, or the most difficult thing to do, to start to think ourselves. What is, what is your, what is actually, what would you say to this? If the West lost part of its reputation, justly, I would say, with good grounds for this, what, what does it mean for us? Stefani, will you start? Nice, easy question. Um, <laughs> I'm joking. Um, I think that maybe there was a, a misunderstanding from the beginning here of what the West meant. I mean, partly people thought it's the opposite of what you had here, or the opposite of communism. But in fact, capitalism has many modalities. And you know, what is except what is the norm in say the UK with a very Anglo-Saxon model or even more in the US is very different from Sweden or Norway. So you could have chosen, and many people wanted to, the Scandinavian model, which is much more, was particularly, and still is, very deeply social democratic in the best sense of the word. Uh, or you could choose a purely, neo, just to simplify, a neoliberal approach. So even within Europe, you have Varieties, and I think that was not problematized, and it wasn't clarified. And I've mentioned this. You know, my, my current obsession are public development banks, which are large state banks that fund essential uh, development spending, research and development, green economy, and so on. And the Germans have one of the largest one in the world. The United Kingdom doesn't have one, so it's a very different financial sector. You have followed much more the UK model, made even more accentuated by the fact that practically all your banks are completely foreign. Yeah? So it's not that you have to choose between the West or not, but what kind of the West. And there are of course also, if you like, the other models which are the Asian models, which have been dramatically successful because they have raised living standards dramatically. First, the East Asian countries, um, you, uh, you know, the Koreas, the Thailands, 
Taiwan, and then China itself. And they have a modality that is a, a, a mixture of markets and state. Um, they have problems, particularly China, of course, deep problems at the political level, but at an economic level, they're very successful. So there is, I think, important to study also those models and to learn what is best and what is most appropriate for the country. Because I think one of the problems when, when communism fell and suddenly you had all these mass of experts, I was involved in them, and I, I at least spoke Czech. I could speak to ordinary people. These guys would just fly in, Jeff Sachs being an example, nice guy as he is, you know, and he would apply more or less the same model in every country. And, 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 but that was also the fault of the Czechs, because they didn't have to accept it. You can blame the IMF, you can, one can blame Jeff Sachs, but in the end, it was the Czechs or other East Europeans that had to choose what kind of model they had. And uh, um, it didn't have to be everything the opposite. So I think there was a, an issue also, which was very much discussed at the time, of the pace of change, how rapidly you change these economies, how rapidly you privatize, and how much you keep of the good things of the old system. Did you have to, for example, privatize medicine as much as you did? I think that that was again, I think, a choice. Um, you know, um, so I, I, I think that, uh, that it's not a question of either the West or not. And plus, I, I agree very much with what you said about that the, the, the West is now uh, less desirable as an objective. I mean, Joe Stiglitz, one always has to quote one boss, so I quote him. Um, but he's also very good. He says that what what the fall of the Berlin Wall did to communism can in many ways be compared to the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. Because that showed that there were central parts of the, of the Western capitalist economy that didn't work well at all. So the appraisal also in the West is of course much more critical. And so, so one needs to, uh, I think you need to reflect that for, for your own countries and for your own realities. Thank you. Boris? Uh, thank you for reminding me of this, Pavel, uh, of the fashion of Middle Europe. I remember it very well. Uh, it came uh, early uh, 80s in former Yugoslavia, and I participated, and we, you know, it was all Kundera, uh, uh, Konrad, but also American uh, historians like Johnson about Middle Europe and about culture of Vienna, the birth of 20th century, Jenny Kentulmin, Wittgenstein's Vienna. It was so cultural, you know, suddenly you had identity and I, I wrote my, also an essay, but I uh, ended the essay quoting also one famous uh, uh, Middle European, Adolf Hitler, who was also a big fan of Viennese culture, et, et cetera. Uh, but, uh, yes, we shall, we shall uh, remember this case, how actually political situation, geopolitical situation was culturalized. And, you know, later, all these ideals of, of, of including velvet revolution, of liberation, of freedom, of democracy, etc., were actually essentialized as a cultural properties of this uh, fiction, uh, uh, normative identity block called West. And the transition to democracy suddenly became simple Westernization, where nobody knows what is the West, except that, you know, like which said uh, Edward Said, it's a fiction like the East. And we got this dichotomy that had survived the Cold War uh, uh, divide of the West and the East, uh, like a big area, East was always belated, and uh, in, 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 in Habermas' definition of the revolution as the Nachholende Revolution, which is a catching up revolution, it is about the East that is belated to catch up with the so-called normal development uh, uh, in, in the West. The problem with these notions uh, is that they totally dehistoricize the, the historical condition of what is, what is happening. 
They, uh, on the one side, you have the East, which has a history, which is of no value, because it is the history of belatedness. One should get rid of this history, which is communist history. And you have the West, which also is a historical non-place, non-place, which has no history because it is beyond history. It is always on time. It is on a proper, proper place and, and time. So this cultural, cultural, just I prepared it. Uh, I, I didn't know that I will need it, but just speaking and also thank you uh, for reminding me, uh, uh, reminding us of the refugee crisis. Uh, why are we today came from uh, from Bihać, from Sarajevo, an a, appeal of uh, of uh, medical workers working there? Thousands of refugees are already three months in this small city in Bosnia. Uh, they are on a on a garbage dump, living there without medical care. Uh, they will lose uh, soon water and and food. This is a catastrophic situation, and they wrote an appeal to the European parliament to immediately to immediately help but then just in 2003 the uh, nato intervention in iraq just to remind you that uh, middle europe was supporting this intervention uh, vaclav havel with eight uh, there were all together eight they wrote an appeal and i have just to remind you that this statement 2003 why to support the intervention they uh, called uh, the, the, the transatlantic bond as a guarantee of our freedom. This is what they wrote, also, also Havel. And uh, democracy, individual freedom, human rights, rule of law, values, you know, values uh, as a properties, cultural, pro essentialized cultural properties of, of the West. Uh, they sailed from Europe to help create the United States, and I quote from the, but uh, they crossed the Atlantic with those who sailed from Europe to help create the United States. I, I said, you know, the former Yugoslavia was uh, actually not a European country, it was not a, simply a mixture of the West and the East, but was a member of the non-aligned countries, and uh, had a contact to the anti-colonial movement, and yes, I read Habermas studying philosophy, but also Franz Fanon at the same time. And uh, Habermas was visiting, you know, as a student, I did an interview, radio interview with, with him. But Fr Franz Fanon was already obligatory literature. And just to quote Franz from The Wretched of the Earth, then he also took this picture of sailing across Atlantic. But then he said, two centuries ago, a former European colony decided to catch up with Europe. It succeeded so well that the United States of America became a monster in which the taints, the sickness, and the inhumanity of Europe have grown to appalling dimensions. You have this, you know, so contradictory historical experience of what is the West. And uh, the problem is obviously that, that uh, speaking, you know, now when uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, organized this uh, ministry for the European way of life, you know, the, uh, essentializing uh, cultural Europe, you know, this, this desperate attempt to construct community uh, uh, on, on some sort of, of essentialist identity and, and the common legacy of totalitarianism, etc. Et but as a way of life, you know, now you see where is the crisis. It will end as, as <laughs> okay, I just, like, just want to remind you that all attempts to construct Yugoslavia as a identity, cultural identity, have failed. And, and it ended as it, as it ended. Uh, so it is very dangerous to think in these terms to, to mistake liberal, uh, 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 liberation and revolution with westernization, to, to identify the ideals of freedom, democracy, equality with uh, some sort of cultural property. Thank you. Pavel? What was the question? <laughs> well, the question I originally posed was about the West. <laughs> yeah, I actually would agree that I wouldn't, I wouldn't um, 
accept that the division between uh, ask this kind of question uh, of the relation of our attitude and relationship uh, towards west i think we are part of the european union that's that's the concrete political context in which uh, in which we are and which defines our possibilities and we should do our best to um, to try to transform the european union but also to to strengthen uh, democracy in this state. What I would like to stress is that we now uh, face, if I go back to the original, uh, original uh, topic of the panel, uh, I would like to ask the question, uh, again, this uh, comparison between 89 and uh, 2019, and uh, approach this question what to do from the point of view of what was the what was the greatest what are the greatest what is the greatest fear what was the greatest fear at that time which actually determined our choices and what are the greatest uh, what is the greatest fear today and at that time it was uh, what actually led the mainstream uh, public in this country uh, and other Central European countries, and of course their political representatives to this liberal choice, was that the greatest fear was the absolute state. The power of the state was the greatest fear you could have. You know, that, that, that was the anti-totalitarian wave of, which actually contained all those and um, combined with neoliberal anti-statism, human rights anti-statism, all those things were somehow suspicious towards the state and were very uh, were trusting non-state actors, civil society or firms and so on and so forth. I would say that today the greatest fear is exactly the opposite. The greatest fear in vis-a-vis -vis economic global system is non-state actors which can uh, the power actually we are we feel powerless vis-a-vis non-state actors uh, it's also i think the case of global warming and ecology crisis we we feel powerless vis-a-vis -vis those forces which are non-state <laughs> environmental forces so we actually realize that we need the state we need the state uh, but of course we need a democratic state and on the level of the uh, European Union the problem is how to democratize at the same time European Union which I think as a unit can face those challenges like global economy and environmental crisis uh, to strengthen democracy of that political unit and at the same time to strengthen democracy of on the national levels, because as uh, this failure of uh, Yanis Varoufakis and his comrades showed, you cannot really build a democratic movement on transnational, transterritorial basis. You need to have, uh, we don't know any other democracy than territorial democracy of the nation state. That's, that's, uh, that's a fact which we can regret, <laughs> we liberals or people who are cosmopolitan, uh, but uh, so how to, I think our challenge today is to strengthen the state, but of course, in order not to fear the state, we have to democratize the state to, to fix uh, the broken democracy on the European level, but also on the level of the, of the national states. Thank you. We have actually comfortable time for the debate, so now I would like to invite Yes, I see many. So we will collect several, several uh, qu questions. You, you, and you. We have three questions for the first round. Please start. Please uh, you know, identify yourself and pose the question. Will we have someone with a micro who would uh, who would go to the audience? We can or use this one, and then we can share. Yeah, so, yeah. so the gentleman in the second in the second row. Andrzej Leder, and I will try not to speak uh, uh, long for a long time because I will be in the second panel. But I, coming from Warsaw, Warszawa, where we have the Cold War, called Civil War in the society, uh, I want to make one small remark about the question of our minorities. Uh, that we don't have anymore this problem. No, we have this problem. In Poland, uh, 
the main man minor minority, this was Jewish minority. It was annihilated by mainly Hitler, Poles a little, but mainly Hitler. But it happened only on material level, on the uh, level of the consciousness, it didn't happen. And one of the forces in the civil war we have now and in the power of Kaczynski is that he is fighting against the uh, phantom of the Jew in Poland. So even if we don't have materially Jews, uh, the phantom of the Jew is very, very present and is really an important factor in the conflict we are living in Poland. Thank you for this remark. There was the gentleman in the third row. Bartosz Rydliński, also from Warsaw, uh, from Ignacy Daszyński Center, but Professor Leder and I, we haven't, you know, agreed that we are going to talk uh, one after the each other. Uh, first of all, it's very interesting for me because we as, a, as a Ignacy Daszyński Center uh, Foundation uh, as Masaryk Academy and Friedrich Heber Stiftung are the same network of FEPS. But we have different discussion in Poland. Basically that we are mostly criticizing we as the kids of the transition of the reality of the 30 years of the Polish Republic. And my question to you is the following. Do you see the West as a source of the problems with the transition? Because the West basically exported such neoliberal conditions of the transition, they never met in their own countries. Just to remind you, and this is the clear data, after every single year of Leszek Balcerowicz plan was one million additional unemployed people. So after three years, there was three millions of Poles without any job. So I'm wondering if you see such a reform as a very democratic and fruitful uh, policy of the West. Thank you, a clear enough question. And there was a gentleman in the fourth row. Please raise your hand. Thank you, my name is Jan Komarek and I'm a professor in the University of Copenhagen. And I have questions for both Boris Budin and Stefan Griffith Jones, starting with uh, Boris. And I think with your appreciation of this continuity, there is a paradox or even a contradiction in how you depict the people of 1989 as somewhat not being the kids, because in a way they were, since being in the streets is not democracy. It's only enchanting the leader who is telling them what to do. And that's precisely what happened, because then what came was precisely technocrats of the 1980s telling them this is the way to prosperity. So uh, my colleague from the LSE called Václav uh, Klaus to be the Lenin for the bourgeois because in a way it was the same, right? The haven, the haven in the end was not the communist equality, it was the capitalist consumerist society. So shouldn't you be more nuanced in your thinking about people of 1989 of being mature in how democracy is being done? It's just the beginning. And to Stephanie, I was really surprised to hear that in the 1990s there was any kind of choice for the reformers. I mean, at the time of the Washington Consensus and the kind of investments which these countries wanted to attract, had there been any investments from Sweden or Norway according to which people could model their economic reforms of 1990s? Of course not. So, I mean, it was a choice in a very, very superficial sense, I would say. Thank you. So we have three uh, questions, comments, one on Phantom Jew, one on uh, the exports of, neoliberali of neoliberalism, which provokes serious crises, and then the two questions which were specific. And we will have another round of questions after it. So I would like to ask all of the panelists for brief reactions or comments. So shall we start with Stefanie again? So thanks for the question. I think, that, I think there were choices because the, the kind of people who came here to give advice were relatively varied. It, you're right that there was a dominance then of the Washington consensus of neoclassical economics in a pure form and that this was seen as the triumph of capitalism over communism. But there were a lot of people who came here and advised, for example, and I was involved in some of those debates. And sometimes the, 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 I would see the Czech side being even more orthodox than the IMF and so on. I remember once visiting a minister with whom I was working here, I won't say who he was, and he very proudly showed me a paper he was co-authoring, actually with a student of Jeff Sachs. But he had chosen to co-author with him, and he, he wrote on the top of this, the title of his paper, How to Increase Inequality. 
And I said to him, Minister, I think you have a little typo here. I think you meant how to increase equality, because that's our concern in the West. Yeah? So, I mean, I did, I did that to say that to him. Others must have said it. So, you know, there's always the external and the internal. I don't think private investors care how, I mean, they obviously lobby for deregulation and privatization and so on. But if you have a good, strong economy like China, and you, you know, they will invest as well. So maybe, maybe there was a, a simplistic belief that, that you had to do all the things that people from Washington and Brussels said. But there were a number of, uh, I mean, there are, there are choices, and there are choices today. And I, I just want to comment something on, on what Pavel said uh, briefly at the beginning of his last intervention, because I think it's really important. Um, I think there is a need. Uh, Czech, Czech Republic is in Europe, yeah? And you are part of the EU. And with lots of problems, the EU helped this country in the transition. And, you know, a lot of money came here, a lot of experts, and they tried their best. To now say, oh, we have nothing to do with Europe, we don't want your immigrants, we don't want to help you with that problem. You know, it's, uh, as a West European, I find it quite shocking and quite ungrateful. I think the answer, in more conceptual terms, is to A, help reform Europe, as, as Pavel said, and also understand that by integrating, and I will say something that the Brexiteers don't get at all, so it's not a critique just of the Czechs, at all, is that the more you integrate with, with Europe, or because that's the bloc which you naturally belong, you will increase sovereignty, you will lose sovereignty at the, at the state level, as, as, as was very clearly said. But the main challenge now is with the multinational forces of capitalism, if you like, of the big banks, of the big companies, and so on. And, and to do that, you have a better chance, not as a small country of 10 or 12 million people, but as a big block like, like, like the European Union. So you, you will gain sovereignty if you participate constructively within this larger block. You can deal better with, with the other blocks like China, United States, but you can also deal better with, particularly with these forces of um, a, of trade and finance, and in which in many aspects the EU has played a positive role. They turned down this trade deal with the United States because it would undermine the rights, if you like, of uh, governments against massive corporations. So sometimes the positions that the EU takes are progressive, and, and, and they should be, I think, supported. Thank you. Before giving floor to, uh, to, to, to Boris, just a brief comment on our European experience, by, because I understand what you say, but I mean, when I reviewed this migration experience and the uh, no of the Visegrad countries to it, I mean, uh, we have to look into genealogy, because at the very beginning, there was no clear no from the part of the Visegrad countries. There was Hungarian no, probably from the very beginning, but with others, uh, there was more, more ambivalence, more ambiguity. And what decided was the fact that we were not listened to. I mean, we, uh, so we sort of presented all kinds of arguments, all kinds of positions. And there was a constellation with some key European countries and in Brussels, which simply ignored the position, ignored the Central European position. And that provoked, that provoked really uh, a lot of rage, actually. And this emotion stays here, you know, and that was, that was a key, that was a key failure, that was a key failure, because, I mean, a priori, these countries are not anti-European, but I mean, if they defend alternative opinion, and they are either not listened to, or they are just, uh, the, the, they are given lessons, then this, this provokes backlash. Boris. Uh, thank you. Um, just the, the comment on these uh, minorities, because I remember, uh, 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 Croatian President Tudjman uh, book one sentence saying uh, look at the Germany how successful is this country after the Second World War because it got rid of its Jewish minority this was in the book of, of course but uh, nobody was upset at that time about about this sentence they meant it's just you know like an idea 
but it, 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 uh, it was then immediately realized in the reality. Uh, now I come to this uh, very good question uh, about possible contradiction of uh, uh, difference between uh, this figure of child and the system of democracy disenchanted, <laughs> which means uh, democratic structures, elites, uh, uh, technocracies, etc. on the one side, and the simple people, common people, who raise this, this or, or, or address ideals like freedom, etc. Et well, I don't think that this is infantile. I really, uh, to, to address freedom in its very abstract and universal Universal, universal uh, 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 meaning, it's something very, very ripe and very courageous. So uh, this is like, uh, you know, a question uh, at that moment, people in the East, they wanted really freedom of movement. But did they really had to, uh, to accept that freedom of movement meant freedom of movement of the capital and of course, the filtering of labor force and control of labor force. Is this the right reaction, understanding, and it was some sort of infantile idea? Or, you know, if, if we say also uh, freedom uh, or uh, equality, equality of individuals, uh, are individuals necessarily understood in terms of this you know, possessive owners, <laughs> as in political liberalism, uh, is this, is, you know, at the moment of uh, real revolution, this is all at stake. Also the question, what is society? Is a society a result of social contract? Or is it, is it something else? And uh, finally, the question of freedom and the, uh, the moment when we saw that this divide Cold War divide collapses. When it was clear that Warsaw Pact is dissolving, why NATO Pact has survived? Why people uh, uh, accepted it? And I'm not blaming the ch children of the East. I'm blaming those on the West who were not able to recognize this call, revolutionary call for a radical change. And you know, they could identify with Kant's idea of, of, of eternal peace because this was the moment. This was the moment when the, the West should uh, instead wait for the East to catch up with already existing concept of democracy, change radically uh, the, 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 the situation, historical situation, to um, identify with this surplus idealistic surplus which was there articulated in the East. Thank you, Pavel. I would uh, take sides with those who claim that we were actually the actors in the early 90s. I remember, first of all, uh, there, were, there were choices. For instance, vis-a-vis uh, -vis foreign, there is a good book by Draho Koppel and Miant about uh, about central use, uh, comparative book about transformation of, uh, of uh, uh, post-communist countries. And there were significant differences, differences in economic policies, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis foreign capital. Václav Klaus didn't like foreign capital. Uh, Hungarians liked, uh, which then really had consequences, quite uh, important consequences. So I disagree with, with the idea that it was pre predetermined, uh, predetermined uh, by the West and that we somehow passively accepted uh, everything. I remember uh, all the more so because we with Lubomir Zaoralek were in the party which tried to promote some sort of social, <laughs> social liberal idea of society and we were defeated. We were defeated in 92 by Klaus and ODS who openly said that they wanted to, uh, part of their program was open uh, the statement that we want to create the class of proprietors, okay, the class of property. And the Czechs gave this party the most votes. So 
I don't know what, you know, th that was the Czech decision. Nobody really imposes upon us this, you know. They, they could have voted for us, <laughs> Lubomir. And maybe we would be living in a different kind of, you know, more Scandinavian capitalism. But they voted for Klaus. So, and, uh, yeah, I think they, they didn't use the word bourgeoisie, but they did use the euphemism, which was Mittelstand, right? We need to create a Mittelstand, the class of property. And the Czechs voted for that. Okay, that's reality. We are responsible for where we are. So let's collect. Let's collect. Uh, th there, this will be the final round for questions and comments. So, who would like to add to the debate? I can't see any hands which would be raised. Yeah, I see one. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> I have heard very old Roman proverb, Historia Magistra Vitae, the history is teacher of the history. Maybe we could try to look a little back to our history, not only Czech history, but to history of all European countries. What happened after First World War, before even the establishment of Social Democratic Party, why this party was established, what was the purpose? I have uh, in my hands one book from Jerzy Taborski. He was former secretary of President Edward Benesch until the very sad end of Mr. Benesch in 1948, and, until his end. The book is named The True is Won, but do you mean the true is winning now? And my question to Mr. Buden. It was very interesting your speech for us about Yugoslavia. Uh, do you mean that it's possible to call Yugoslavia so-called third way? With something between... The third the, way, the third way. The third way, yes. Between that's communism and capitalism. That's right, yes, yeah, that, that's correct. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And it, it was also possible to compare Yugoslavia with the position of Mr. Gorbachev that time during his story. It was some chance, chance when Gorbachev wouldn't be finished that way. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any uh, more questions or yes? Well, okay, we will take two but brief ones, please. Each of you should be brief in the last row. Uh, hello, Ian Likas, a student here. Uh, well, one question for Mr. Budin. Um, when you talk about when the Warsaw Pact dissolved, why hadn't the NATO? And my question is, um, why it prevailed? Why do you think it hadn't dissolved? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And there is your neighbor. Yeah. Uh, uh, Jan Czerny. I was a bit surprised by the by the consensus uh, implicit in the in the debate that we have uh, we have reached our goals that, that we uh, we have achieved uh, uh, what we wanted in in uh, 89 because I would say that what what uh, we are seeing now is uh, is a kind of uh, resentment like popular resentment that big portions of the of the population in not only here, but generally in, in uh, Central and East uh, European, are somehow like regretting, like, like openly regretting what, uh, what has happened. Uh, they are complaining about like substantial differences between West and East, the differences in wages, in the, in the quality of, of uh, uh, food. Uh, in, uh, it also concerns the foreign policy. There is a big resentment uh, against NATO and, and uh, US foreign policy and some kind of new sympathy towards Russia and, and, uh, and Russian foreign policy. And I'm afraid that it, it can be maybe like half of the population which, which is thinking in, in, uh, in this way, which is uh, quite dissident to, towards this consensus that we have, uh, we have achieved our goals and we are part of uh, Europe. Thank you, for Western these, Europe. thank you for these questions. I would also like to invite our participants, because this is a final round, by reacting to these questions, please try to reflect also what would be your message or recommendation for, for the future. We would like to benefit from your wisdom. So.
So we will start with Boris because I mean you had several questions and then uh, uh, a piece of wisdom from you. Go for it. Yeah. Uh, first, thank you for uh, for uh, addressing this problem of, of history and historia est magistra vita. The the problem is that. Uh, that history is something we cannot learn from. And uh, Gadamer translates this uh, historia in historia as gedechnis, as uh, memory, which, you know, in the old pre-modern world, it was possible that children learn from their parents. But becoming subject that creates something new, history is, is not a space of learning. This is what Friedrich the Great uh, said once, that what we can learn, what, what uh, the, 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 the children can learn, uh, can only repeat the stupidities of, of their parents. So, uh, history is a, a, a horizon of the new, modern history. And this is precisely what was believed, you know, as a post-historical turn, that history as a subject that creates a new forms of life uh, disappears and that uh, also the idea of future disappears. Uh, uh, history as a horizon of expectations, uh, as Kozelek would say. So this is now when we say, we see that something is happened, uh, happening again in the world and uh, we think about the return of history. Well, I don't know which history is now returning, uh, but obviously the, the modern history is not. It is something, something else. So it is, uh, we, we live in a situation in which it is almost impossible to articulate some sort of historical experience and to, to create some sort of genealogies from which we could create a perspective, future perspective. This is the, the problem. And then speaking, uh, speaking of this uh, case of former, uh, former Yugoslavia, um, uh, you know, being suspicious about the West means also for me uh, 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 being aware that uh, Slobodan Milosevic, that was uh, called the last communist apparatchik in Europe <laughs> and, uh, and the 99 and at the moment of the bombing was actually a bank director from New York that the uh, chief of staff, Yugoslav chief of staff who, who found refuge in, in Russia later, uh, Kadievich was actually West Point educated officer. So the, the West supported Milosevic because his program of reforms was very, very neoliberal. So they didn't have at that time any problem with combining nationalism and neoliberal reforms. Uh, the, the problem is, uh, again, uh, Yugoslavia is not simply a sort of bastard mixture of the East and of the, of the West. It was opened and uh, actively opened into what is called South, into what is called at that time Third World. And it was actively involved in, in uh, anti-colonial uh, at that time uh, 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 processes. Just, just to think, you know, now you see how deep we have fallen when we have really this, this, this uh, uh, tragical choice, either West or Russia. You know, this is, just, just imagine how has happened that we have arrived to this impossible choice. So I just like okay. <laughs> okay. quit here. So I asked Pavel, Pavel. I, think I, I would react uh, on this remark of Jan Czerny that, uh, that we didn't, uh, I, 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 my take is different, I already said that. I think we reached those goals, market, market economy, liberal democracy, return to Europe. But we found out that this is not the promised land which we imagined, okay? This is different, you know, we reached the goals with all their contradictions and with the crisis which we are in now. So it's up to us as well to cope with the crisis together with the others. I don't really take up this uh, division between West and Central Europe. Yeah, I, actually, along similar lines with uh, Pavel, I mean, somebody asked, you know, said that in terms of foreign policy, uh, the Czech Republic is becoming very critical of the West. Well, so are many people in the West, I mean, you know, Trump doesn't walk on the streets of London. He only helicopters in, helicopters out, because there will be millions of people protesting against him. Um, 
some of these idiotically voted for Brexit, but that's another subject. Uh, but I think you have to understand that the West is also going through a crisis. I think it was triggered by, particularly strongly by the global financial crisis, which shattered sort of the, the perception that well, that incomes will be continually improving. And in many countries, it's led to a very strong shift to the extreme right, very worrying. I mean, Le Pen didn't win, but she's still there. Um, you know, uh, the Italian extreme right is out of government, thankfully, but it still looms large. Uh, we have Mr. Far we have Farage, we have, uh, you know, in Austria, um, a bit weaker, even in Germany. I mean, Germany, who used to be so pure about not having anything to do with its Nazi past, you know, has very important positions from the AFD. Um, so I think, I think progressives in the West and in the East have to work together. The only answer is not a Czech answer or a French answer or an American answer, but is, is how progressives together can work, both nationally, in, your, in our national context, but also jointly. Um, and so thinking about, you know, whether we are more towards the West or more towards Russia, it's, I think how jointly we can do things that, that will increase welfare for people, but that will also defeat these very dark forces that have been unleashed since the global financial crisis and which are particularly strong in some East European countries, but they're also strong in Western Europe. So Western Europe also needs your help as, as much as you, you need the help from the West and from other parts of the world. So I would define it much more in, in this perspective of progressive versus very, very, very reactionary forces. Some people say, that in part it's a failure of us, of the, of the left, of the central left, to have provided alternatives to neoliberalism in time, to have often been captured by neoliberalism that has aided the rise of this, of this extreme right. So now to fight it, we have to give good answers. Thank you. Boris has two words to add. I just, uh, okay, uh, to answer the question, I was directly asked, uh, but I, f yeah, I forgot, yeah, yeah. which is about the survival of NATO. I would very simply give an answer. The survival of NATO is one of the first strongest acts of the counter-revolution. Thank you very much. I uh, thank you for our guests, for their insights. I would like to thank to the audience for your patience, for your questions. And without any break, actually, we go to the second panel which will, be sh which will be chaired by Petr Aga. And I would uh, like to invite all the participants to the second panel to come directly to the podium. Thank you. Thank you.
So I would like to slowly start the, the, the second panel of the evening by first introducing the idea behind the second panel and then our distinguished guests. So the idea of the second panel was not so much to look back on the history of 1989, but more so to analyze the consequences of the developments of, of the early 90s and look at how they might have influenced the, the current predicament of, of European project and the Central European region as a whole. Now, the, the title um, of, the, um, of the second panel is uh, From Protest to Politics and to Protest. And the, the title in itself tries to show that there has been a certain dynamics in how we understand politics, political institution, what democracy means, rule of law, etc., etc. Now, uh, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce our guests today, um, scholars that I greatly admire and been following their work for many, many years. So I'll start with Jody. Um, so that I get all your oppositions properly. <laughs> Jody is a political philosopher and political theorist. And she's counted among the more radical uh, theorists um, in the area. So we're hoping that she might bring a bit of, you know, uh, radicalism into our panel discussion. Um, then we have Andrzej Leder, who is uh, also a philosopher by training um, <clears throat> and uh, he's a very famous uh, author of an interesting book, uh, The Sleepwalking Democracy, and uh, also Revolution. Yeah, and uh, uh, and also we're hoping that he will bring a lot of insights into the regional developments uh, in the past 30 years. And now, last but not least, Professor Colin Crouch is a is a big. Uh, a distinguished uh, emeritus professor of the Warwick University, a person that has uh, coined the term post-democracy into the academic uh, discourse. So thank you very much, uh, our dear guests, for accepting our invitation. And um, let me start by actually uh, asking uh, the initial uh, questions for each one of you. Now, I would like to start with Colin and ask him a question about um, post-democracy, what it means today. Why does he think that the Central European region shows the symptoms of post-democracy and whether he thinks that maybe um, the crisis of democracy that we're experiencing at the moment has something to do with uh, the neoliberal project? Thank you, uh, Jay. Um, Post-democracy, as I argued it, has two main sources. One is globalization, which removes the most important economic policy decisions away from the national level at which democracy has been best established. And, uh, and, and that's something that we exper has been, is experienced right across the world, so there's no distinction really between East and West Europe on that matter. The second cause is, is more subtle and more difficult to understand. And that if, looking at it from a point of view of, of Western Europeans, uh, we have been accustomed to having democracy where the, the, vote, the, the electoral system and the social structure threw up a very small number of large block parties, stereotypically a, a, a left one based in the working class movement, and a right-wing one based mainly in Christianity as well as in, in bourgeois positions. Sometimes they're more complicated, but that was the basic thing. And, and politics was dominated by these two. There were lots of little parties around them, but these two dominated, and they meant a lot to people's lives. They, 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 they responded to past struggles about who should be included in and who should be excluded from citizenship. And people had a memory uh, of that. Uh, eventually it became a memory, just a memory, and a, mem and a memory of what had happened to parents and grandparents, but it, it, it enabled these block parties to continue, and that's how we ex were able to connect ordinary social life to political life. Gradually, those blocks have wasted away. Too much time has passed. We now have a, a post-industrial, secularized society 
in which the old issues of the early 20th century have gone. Uh, and so we're left with people, with a large number of people feeling disconnected from, uh, from the, 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 there's no party that they feel, yes, this represents me. So in, it, although now in Eastern Central Europe, you have a different experience because you had the, the communist system, so you didn't have this development of these two electoral blocks, but we end up in the same position. We all end up with parties that don't have much social depth to them. And then coming up through the middle of that, and we'll talk about this more in a minute, I suppose, we have uh, nationalism as something people do feel very deeply and which now is getting political expression. And so I, I think there's, there's a common experience here. Um, and in a way, in Central Europe, after 1989, you walked right into post-democracy. And democracy was already quite sick when you arrived there. Uh, and you're sharing now very much in the same symptoms. Now, do you want me to talk about neoliberalism as well in this same little piece? I think you asked me originally last week, um, was neoliberalism a sort of cause of post-democracy? I think in the first instance, it's the other way round, that that weakening of, uh, of popular attachment to parties, uh, deeply rooted parties, made it possible for neoliberals to capture the political system. Now then, it, th there's then re reciprocal effects. Uh, and I certainly think it's also true that, uh, neo uh, that post-democracy is the best political form for neoliberalism. Remember Ma uh, Lenin said that, that liberal democracy was the best shell for capitalism. Well, because uh, neoliberals like a stable constitutional order. They like a rule-governed system. Uh, the, 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 because the, the, if you read all the neoliberal idea, uh, uh, philosophers, it's very important that there is a stable constitutional order in which property can work. And if you don't have any democracy, you're quite likely not to get that stability. On the other hand, if democracy is very strong, it starts making demands for public spending and, and, and things. So post-democracy, where you've got all the institutions are in place, lovely constitutional order, but there's not much life in it. That's the perfect political shell for neoliberalism. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Colin, uh, for the opening statement. Now, um, Jody, I would like to ask you, uh, you might have a bit of a different uh, position on this. Um, you're known that, uh, unlike many other thinkers on the, on the left, you define politics in terms of antagonism and clash between uh, different positions. And also, unlike many other thinkers, you kind of advocate uh, a return to uh, a party, party hierarchy and party structure. So how do you see this as a sort of a reaction to the situation that we find ourselves in at the moment and perhaps Colin's uh, introductory statement? Okay, thanks. Um, so I want to um, address your question whether I want to put it into three parts. I want to talk about the present a bit, and I want to talk about the present in terms of communication networks, um, an idea that I've developed called communicative capitalism. And then I'm going to connect antagonism to that, and then look at political forms that are responsive to that. So. Um, if we look at the present right now, we can, and I think about this in a really broad sense, we can say that we are in a time of, you know, of mass media, uh, mass personalized media networks. I bet everybody in here is at a cell phone, half of y'all are on them right now, right? So everybody <laughs> is really like tied into digital networks. So um, my idea of, com of communicative capitalism theorizes the merger of capitalist production and our means of communication or means of discussion, right? Our means of expression are directly functional for capital, for capitalist production, as well as for the generation of capitalism's new raw material, data, information, right? Everyone knows about big data. We generate it constantly. We can't help it. So there's two primary characteristics of communicative capitalism that are relevant for us in this discussion. Um, the first is that Networks produce inequality. This is a basic feature of complex networks. Complex networks have three attributes. They're characterized by free choice, 
growth and preferential attachment. So what we, the best examples are sort of from pop culture. We think about Twitter. Like one of the uh, most popular people on Twitter is a pop star named uh, Katy Perry. She's got like over 158 million followers. Most people have 200. Um, so that kind of give, that's a power law distribution of inequality. It's the same thing with blockbuster movies, right? Thousands of movies are made every year and then only one or two like become huge blockbusters. So this is the power law distribution of inequality. It means that networks characterized by free choice, growth, and preferential attachment generate inequality. The bigger the network, like something like Twitter or Facebook, the greater the inequality, right? So the, the more the, the more people are brought into a market, into a market, the greater the inequality that's produced. So networks produce inequality. Inequality is imminent. It comes out of our free choices. The second attribute of communicative capitalism that's really important is the change in what happens to meaning, to communication, to truth and falsity. The meaning of our utterances disintegrates and what really matters is just how much is something shared, right? And the sharing of it doesn't depend on whether or not it means something. It just means is it easily transmittable? So, you know, it's really easy to circulate cat photos. It won't offend anybody. They can go really fast or you measure whether or not one of your messages mattered if it gets a lot of retweets or shared. Again, the content doesn't matter. What matters is how much it circulates. So this is, you can call this a change from the use value of communication to communication's exchange value. Now, in, then, in, in, in communicative capitalism then, which is globally ubiquitous, we have extreme inequality, and we have the kind of politics of the daily outrage or the affective circulation of outrages all the time. Which gets mobilized politically? The inequality or the outrage? Which one of these? This leads me now to the second point I wanna talk about in response to Peter's question, which has to do with antagonism or which side are you on? The side of inequality that's gonna hold up that as the problem or the side that's gonna circulate outrage constantly. So I think that you can't say anything about what society fears or what society thinks, right? What you can talk about is what does this group, class, sector fear, right? What is this um, classes or this sectors, what are they really worried about? So something like, like the term like civil society, that's a name for depolitization. The whole idea that we can talk about society as a whole is a name for the evisceration of something like class or class struggle and instead a kind of fantasy that we are all in something together. Um, I think it's an effacement of the political. I think it's an a, a fiction that denies the fact of inequality and the fact of exploitation. So um, Boris asked earlier, like, what is society, right? It was a rhetorical um, question. I would say society is what is built around a fundamental antagonism. And typically, in, you know, since the uh, end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, the way to talk about that antagonism has been class struggle. When we can't talk about that antagonism in terms of class struggle, it gets co-opted into forms of nationalism and forms of racism. It gets co-opted into an ethnic politics when it should be a class politics. So then this turns me to the third character, uh, the third um, part of the, um, my answer or response, which has to do with forms of collectivity or um, political forms today. And it seems um, that it's not a strange leap to say that currently um, in the kind of global networked world where, that we inhabit, that the dominant actors seem to be forms, I mean, I'm sorry, seem to be firms, like giant corporations, particularly, I think a lot about tech, um, tech companies, Google, Facebook, Amazon, um, it seems to be banks right? Um, giant banks, giant, giant um, tech companies and media companies. Um, in the US, a, a primary political form is that of the police. Um, and then of course there's NGOs, right? And so these forms are ultimately depoliticizing insofar as they are, their um, purpose is to maintain a status quo that helps the rich, enriches the rich, and immiserates everyone else. They want to make things stay the same for the benefit of the top 1%. Um, if there's going to be something like a radical change to this 
um, structure or this scenario or this environment, that requires radical political parties. And I say political parties as a way to designate a form that scales, that can be and has been international, that's militant, and that perseveres beyond the kind of left infatuation with movements and artistic production. So I think that it's crucial for a left politics to actually embrace again the form of a revolutionary political party. Now, does that mean that we know that there are uh, specific parties out there that invite that kind of participation? Um, in much of the um, sort of global north, not so much. <laughs> we don't see them, but we see small versions. We see somewhat de-radicalized, but radically potential version. And here I'm thinking about Jeremy Corbyn and the far left of, of the British Labour Party. Um, but I think that the more that um, people on the left can return to thinking in terms of political forms capable of strategy, the more likely we are to move through the world of a changing climate um, in ways that don't simply continue our own immiseration. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, that was a very interesting uh, expose. Now, Andre, your book, um, Sleepwalking the Revolution, uh, was a big hit and, and seemingly in your I would say that it touched upon something very fundamental in the Polish, and not only in the Polish society, but you know across the region. Now, your book looks in the past and tries to uncover certain dynamics, certain reasons for certain types of behavior and patterns in society. Do you think if you would kind of revisit your thesis and look into the present and in the future of, the, of Europe, Central European region and the European project as a whole, can you find some links between these two? Uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, yes, I would say that the um, kind of history I am trying to do is a long-term history, so the difference between 89 and today is not so, so big. And um, I would say that uh, the, um, the most important consequence of this specific revolution in Poland and but I think also in Eastern Europe and I will speak what kind of revolution I'm thinking about I'm not thinking about 89 as revolution uh, so the most important consequence is that the mm, societies and the hegemonic classes in these societies uh, which is middle class today lack of uh, internal legitimacy and lack of uh, social imaginary or narrative which would give this internal legitimacy to play the role uh, they have in the society. And it is obvious for me uh, as to Poland or Hungary, uh, also for example Lithuania and other uh, countries in this region. I was not absolutely sure uh, about the Czech Repu Republic, but when Pavel was speaking about the elections in 92, and when uh, uh, Czechs voted not to take responsibility of a uh, mm, social model of capitalism, I would say, but to uh, uh, they prefer the model of individualistic everybody for himself. I thought that, yes, it was the moment when they didn't want to be responsible. They didn't want to take a general responsibility for, uh, for the society. And in this sense, uh, there is a deep lack uh, in, uh, I would say, common consciousness or social consciousness in our countries, the lack of legitimacy and a general lack of uh, legitimacy. It makes uh, the middle class search uh, in two directions. First direction is the West, a completely mythical entity, as it was said here, uh, the West doesn't exist. So it is a myth of the East that there is something like West. And, uh, and uh, the search of the West is uh, 
was uh, driven in such a way that uh, we are as good uh, Westerners as uh, uh, New Yorkers or Parisians or London people or somewhere else. And we will behave like them, we will uh, send our children to the, their schools, we will go to skiing in Trois-Vallées in France, and uh, everything will be like uh, uh, as if we would be the same. And this was, I would say, the transformation ideology. But the other side is that uh, we are very different, and the other myth uh, legitimizing myth is we are absolutely different. We have our noble past and this past is um, a past of uh, medieval time in matter of fact. So of long lasting medieval time as French school of annals called it and then they uh, see in many European countries uh, the medieval time uh, uh, in the 19th century and in Poland, I would say, till 39, uh, till the mm, beginning of the Second World War. So uh, uh, this is the reaction for this lack of legitimacy. And I would say that the ideology of Kaczynski is exactly this. We are Europeans, but not in the sense of the enlightenment and not in the sense of the uh, emancipatory fights of 19th century class conflicts and 20th century social welfare state, but we are Europeans in the sense of the medieval fights against Islam, of uh, uh, nobles uh, with their uh, bravery and all this stuff. And uh, uh, we will teach again, and Christianity naturally, and we will teach again Europe to be this, not to be this uh, rotten, uh, horizontal uh, uh, enlightenment ideal, but uh, a good traditional hierarchical society. And, uh, and uh, the source of all this is that, uh, at least in Poland, the, uh, what I call revolution uh, we didn't do, we sleepwalk through, was the revolution between 39 and 56. So I will uh, not make now a very long speech about this revolution, but uh, I will tell only that this long lasting medieval structure of the society, which was big landlords, peasants, very poor peasants, 70% of the society, very poor peasants, and 10% of the society, Jews, which were middle class merchants, uh, uh, mediators. And it was extremely stable, stabilized by the national and religious differences, was completely destroyed. First destroyed by the uh, Holocaust, by the Hitler's intervention, and then destroyed by Stalinist and communist intervention in the sense of destroying the hege hegemony of the late landlords and nobility and intelligentsia, which was uh, coming from them. And uh, a massive advance of uh, peasant population was the revolutionary, again, effect of all this. But it has no narrative. It is never viewed as a social revolution. It is always viewed only as a national fight against two uh, empire, empires of evil, the Nazi empire and uh, Soviet empire. So we never try to understand, at least in Poland, but I think it is true also for, for Hungary, uh, what really happened during this period. And uh, that's why we cannot legitimate uh, the position of the new middle class, which uh, was born in this period and which is now the most powerful part of, of the society. Thank you very much, Andre. So these were three very interesting and very powerful intervention. And I would like to invite you, the panelists, if you would like to comment and react to each one of your um, opening remarks before we move on to the questions that I have prepared for you. <laughs> 
Would you like to start? Yeah. yeah. That, that, and that was fascinating. <laughs> I, I, you have to be careful not to overgeneralize about Central Europe, though. Of course, I'm the Czech, uh, Slan, Slovak land were very, very different experience before 1939. This was an advanced industrial country. I mean, um, so the, the, and I think, in a way, the, the concepts that people keep using of East and West now really relate mainly to the, the shared history of the Soviet bloc. And, and Yugoslavia is different again. But the Soviet bloc did put you, all of you, in, in a different category with the suppression of, of free debate, suppression of democratic politics, um, and eventually a lot of historic uh, economic backwardness. That made a group that could be compared with another group called the West. You take all that away, and we've now had it, it's been gone for 30 years, then I don't really see East and West as the most important distinction. Uh, 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 I think Stephanie was saying similar things before. Um, and I would see distinction between the United States and various parts of Europe uh, as more profound than the difference between, say, uh, the Czech Republic and, 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 and Germany. Um, so I think we've got to get beyond East and West now. Uh, there, there were legacies, obviously, le that legacies have continuing roles, but there isn't a hegemonic West and there isn't a hegemonic East anymore. I, in fact, I, in research I've done on social structure, there is more diversity in, in this old Central Europe than the, uh, in looking at things like level of inequality, occupational structure, economic specialisms. There's more diversity in the old Soviet bloc than there is in the West. It's, it, it's curious, but, but so we're all advanced industrial societies and, some, and a lot of us are in Europe. Uh, I, I profound very, di disagree very profoundly with Jody because there won't be a revolutionary working class. Uh, revolutionary classes are only likely to happen when people really do face uh, a, an absence of freedom at a time when they feel they have the power to express their interests. Now, Marx wrote uh, famously, uh, workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. This is a perfect rational choice statement. Right? All you have, chains are a negative. If all you have to lose is a negative, then obviously you act. Right? Now, very few people in, in, industri in relatively wealthy, middle-income and rich countries today feel they only have chains. They have a lot in their lives. Uh, and they are very, very unlikely to, to take the risk of joining movements that destroy all that. So I think you, you, you won't get a revolutionary movement until you've destroyed existing democratic institutions that do allow some freedom of expression and also destroy people's prosperity. So that, that, that revolutionary class isn't going to happen. So we have to find other ways of achieving our ends that don't expect that to take place. Maybe if I can intervene, maybe Andre, would you like to react to what what Colin said? Okay, okay. So Jody, go. Um, so um, first, I want to say where some of my disagreements are with Colin, and yeah. then I will um, um, respond. Oh no! First, I want to say something about Andre. Though I'm not trying to position you as like who you're going to side with, but um, what I did, what I really liked about yours was the emphasis on the appeal um, to some segments of Polish society of hierarchy again. I think that's, we talked a little bit about this earlier. I think that's, um, I think it's not accidental given the, um, the larger structures and network societies of hierarchy, that that actually produces the kind of, of you know, to lack of a better term, a kind of um, structural base for that sort of ideology. I find it completely compelling and interesting. Um, on Colin, it's interesting that the post-democracy thesis emerges at a time when media is promising democracy, right? Me media, uh, network media was promising that everyone can participate, everyone can speak. And so there's this kind of interesting, you know, the, the, the announcement of something is present at the moment when it's not there that I, that I just think is worth noting. I also think it's worth noting that, um, that 
the I think your description of, of kind of parties and democratic society may apply better to England than the United States, given that the fact of slavery and, and race inequality has such a massive structuring um, role in the US. And so to have talked about the US as a kind of democracy has always um, obscured the fact that it's founded in a, you know, settler colonialism and, and um, genocide, and also as a slave country. And that's a really crucial thing to comment when one wants to say, oh, we're post-democracy, because it does imply that there was some sort of heyday, and that heyday then would have been at a time of Jim Crow in the United States, which means it was not demo democratic. Now, the interesting thing about um, that, it, it's so funny that you say, um, you know, oh, we're post-democracy, and then you're like, but you know, for there to be anything revolutionary, we would have there would have to be a destruction of democracy. Well, so which is it? Are there democratic institutions that are functioning and there, or is it the case that we're actually in a time of no um, legitimately democratic institutions and rampant inequality? precarity, um, austerity, the, the actual collapse of basic infrastructures. So it seems to me that actually your own diagnosis should be able to say something about the, con the political conditions of post-democracy that actually might promote some kind of radical upheaval. And it also seems to be the case that Extinction Rebellion is at least one form of political movement, loosely organized in the UK, where people actually um, are willing to do quite a lot, that they feel like, in fact, the situation of the planet is one where they don't have anything to lose but their chains, and we all actually have quite a lot to lose. So I think that under conditions of unbelievable inequality and planetary warming, the conditions for something more revolutionary is, actu is actually present. <coughs> Mm. So I will continue the discussion, maybe. <laughs> and uh, first I will uh, be local and then I will try to be global. Um, I think that uh, it is obvious that uh, Czech Republic has a different history and social history or economic history than Poland or Hungary or Rom Romania. And uh, I was asking myself coming here into Prague if this model of uh, lack of legitimacy um, is also uh, available for uh, the Czech Republic, which has bourgeoisie in the end of 19th and beginning of 20th century. But uh, more I understand the Czech Republic, more, more I think it is. It, uh, and uh, it would be a good question for historians. Uh, why, uh, what happened? during uh, the period of, let's say, between the uh, Czechoslovakia of uh, between two wars and 89, um, what happened that made uh, this problem of legitimacy and moral responsibility, I would say, in political sense, uh, so important also in Czech, Re Czech Republic? Uh, I don't have a, a quick answer, but I think it is uh, there is something in common. And when you say that uh, 30 years, uh, we, are, we had 30 years of, of different situation, yes, but I don't think uh, enough happened during this 30 years to give us this uh, uh, kind of legitimacy. And I would say, for example, for me, what happening now in Poland may give this not the regime of Kaczynski, but the resistance and the fight for democracy on different levels in Poland uh, may give the, this kind of in, internal legitimacy uh, which we lacked in 89 for different reasons. And maybe this will be uh, one of good things coming with this not very sympathetic regime. And, uh, and uh, when I try to go to the global level, I'm thinking about, um, yes, I agree that East-West is not anymore a category, and we shall speak more about North-South. But if we are looking for a working class, for example, it exists, but in South. 
in, south, in global south, if we look at Chinese uh, society or on Indian society or uh, many other societies, it, it, there are uh, enormous amounts of people which are working class. The problem is that our political institutions, uh, I would say, uh, don't see them. We cannot see, politically see them. And the only representative of them is the uh, global climate crisis, in matter of fact, and immigration crisis. Mm -hmm. And these two crises are, in matter of fact, the signifiers of the uh, uh, deep conflict between the North and the South. So how politi we politically respond to these two crises will be the answer to this inequality, that uh, outrageous uh, inequality in the uh, global uh, distribution of everything. Uh, and here I agree with, with you that uh, response to global climate uh, crisis will be politically one of the most important uh, facts uh, in the next, I think, 10 years maybe, or more, because this will be a real political challenge to all the societies in, in the northern part of the world, not speaking about the southern part. So in this sense, there is something we have in common with the south, and this is the climate crisis or cl climate catastrophe. We must try to get the debate forward and unified somehow. Um, I mean, I, and I, I, Jody's points about community of capitalism, I, I think, are superb. I was only disagreeing with her about the formation of a revolutionary working class, but the actual analysis of contemporary capitalism I like very much. Uh, as I see the, world, the, the, the northern world at the moment, the global north, uh, we have... Uh, as I said, mainly in Western Europe, not in Central Europe and not in the United States, these are different political formations. But in Western Europe, we've, had the, we've got these declining blocks of social democracy and Christian conservatism, still there, still the biggest things, but getting smaller. Uh, and then around them, a diversity of other parties and more important movements. And so if you look out on the scene, you would say the two most important movements that one sees are the climate change movement, uh, especially that being led by the young, and, and various forms of feminism. Seems to me they're, they're the, two, the two sort of new forces you can see. Um, against them is uh, two other forces, uh, which are uh, neoliberalism and xenophobic nationalism. And these two are natural enemies, actually, because uh, neoliberalism wants globalization. It is, the part, it is the movement of globalization. Xenophobic nationalism is very hostile to it. But they can form a very cynical alliance because if, if, if politics, if democracy and political debate stays at, that, at the national level, then uh, neoliberals are very happy. Okay, you can have your Brexit, you can wave your Union Jack, you can wave your various different flags and enjoy your national sovereignty. Meanwhile, we can run the world because no one's going to get in our way. Right? And so, uh, in a way, although neoliberals are deeply divided about xenophobic nationalism, they're very frightened of it, they, they see it as an envy of their projects, there can be a political alliance there. And this is extremely powerful. And so one has to say, if one's looking at it from a, a sort of broadly left or progressive position, uh, you've got there one force which has an enormous amount of economic power behind it, especially the new communicative capitalism giants, which weren't there when neoliberalism started. Secondly, you've got uh, this, this powerful force of, of people identifying with their nation in a way that makes them resent, uh, to want to exclude, and therefore eventually to hate people. Uh, people who don't come in their national category. Uh, you've got these two very powerful forces. Against them, you've got a whole series of other things which, which don't have the same power, that, that don't 
that, that don't that have neither the economic clout nor the passion that, the, that nationalism c can wield. Uh, but the, the future of decent societies, for me, lies in that rather disparate set, that amalgam mixture of social democrats, greens, women, uh, left socialists, lib left liberals, worried moderate conservatives, despite, who are very, very divided among themselves. Somehow they are the only things that stand between us and a cynical alliance of neoliberalism and xenophobia. Um, I, I want to think about, well, I want to say two things, and these are related. First, I guess I don't share the description that the working class only lives in the global south. Um, I think that there is clearly, there are workers in um, the global north. They may not be working um, the majority in factories. Many work in the service sector. Um, and some still work in factories, but it's the invisibility that you, you mentioned rightly, but I think we've got to remember that is the case in the North. There's also, there is poverty in the North. There is a miseration in the North. The divisions are in the cities. Sometimes they take expression now, I just, if I'm using the United States as an example, but I think it's broader in terms of struggles around rents, right? Struggles with the price of housing, the fact that cities are so expensive that people can't live there anymore. I mean, that, that that's a class struggle. It's done through the, pro through the issue of rents rather than through the exploitation of, la of labor, right? But it's a social reproduction problem. Um, in, the, in the US, there are, there are labor struggles. Um, General Motors is having the, it's now been on strike for over a month. That's a big, that's a big kind of strike. Um, teachers and nurses, again, letting, um, drawing attention to social reproduction struggles have been major forces of class struggle in, um, in the US. So I think we need to keep in mind that there are still workers and people who are economically exploited in the global north. And the problem is the, that social democrats and left liberals don't talk in terms of the economic immiseration of their constituencies. This is what enables a nationalist language to become appealing. I actually, I don't buy it that people are naturally nationalist. I think that, that um, ideologies can take hold and that if there is not a competing narrative of people's misery, then that will, be, that will take hold. But it's not the case that someone is sort of born a nationalist, right? You can live in multicultural societies where people are not basically nationalist. Um, yeah. Would you like to, or yeah, before, yes. So no. Okay, so uh, we'll take the first round of questions. So if there are any um, comments from the audience. Yeah, there's one gentleman. So we, yeah, you were first and then we go to Petr Druak. If you would introduce Thank yourself you. and also, and there's a third one. Again, I would like to ask Mr. Leder about Polish situation nowadays com comparing with the movement of Solidarność especially about the role of Lech Valens at the time, because you know that time it was something like end of the tunnel here. I have heard about it. It was some hope for Czechoslovakia at the time that will be some new model. It will be not uh, supporting the Iron Curtain. I will be not supporting the misery of poor people and so on. And also if you have some information about uh, Valesa ideas. I have read his uh, autobiography, but it was for me not completely <laughs> clear. What this, this is a very thick book, but it's not clear what, what's the matter there. What is his position nowadays? And he has it, uh, this Solidarność movement has some uh, chance in the future to give some solution. And then, uh, because the main force uh, in uh, your country is the Roman Catholic Church, what was uh, the, uh, about the story of Jerzy Popielusko and what, what, which ideas were of Jerzy Popielusko, if he is able to advise for us, I think, nowadays. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we take two more. Yes. Is 
uh, microphone, please. My question is to Jody. Uh, how do you see uh, the possibility of the use of violence as a tool of the class struggle? Yeah, uh, brilliant panel, um, but a little bit pes on the pessimistic side. So how can we get out of this? For example, two questions. Um, how can we, how can progressives help convince the working class in the North um, that, they, that their cause is better served by them rather than by this unholy alliance, as Colin described it, of neoliberals and xenophobes. And what are, what are like the key ideas for this progressive? Because you mentioned rightly, you know, climate change. I think climate change is absolutely essential and galvanizing, particularly of young people. Um, they are, I think, a revolutionary force that hasn't been mentioned. But other things like uh, income inequality is important, I think, more in the United States than in Europe, more in, in the UK than in continental Europe. Um, but what else? I mean, income inequality, of course, is important. But what else that can really move people to either have a revolution or just vote for more progressive parties and ensure that these parties then, when they are in power, deliver uh, progressive policies and don't get captured by this strong interest? Thank you. So, panelists, if you would like to answer the questions. They have individual questions. Yes. Would you like to answer the first question? So, um, the uh, question about history. First of all, uh, I must say that I am uh, of the uh, first solidarity, of the Solidarity 8081 uh, movement, mm, and uh, I cannot be objective speaking about Valenza because I love him. So, uh, I, uh, for me, it's a very important person and uh, uh, everything I will say will be a little <laughs> unobjective. But, nevertheless, uh, his position in Pol Polish politics is very weak now. Um, he um, uh, was supporting very strongly the neoliberal reforms and transformation in the 90s. And uh, I would say solidarity never uh, um, accepted it. So it is not an accident that Valencia is not anymore in solidarity as trade union. Solidarity as trade union made Valencia out. Yes, it is uh, one of the two major trade unions in Poland, but it is very conservative. It is a Christian or Catholic trade union. And, uh, Solidarność. Solidarność, yes. And they are uh, an important ally of Kaczyński. And uh, Valencia is uh, politically linked with the uh, Liberal Party, with the Platforma Obywatelska. So, uh, but he, in his uh, way of thinking, uh, he is defending the dem democracy in Poland, and it is true that he is defending democracy in Poland, and he has some critical uh, thoughts about how it happened, what made Kaczyński so strong. Nevertheless, he was never a theoretician, he was always a practitioner, so if he has something to do in practice, and especially if he has a political force behind him, he can do uh, absolutely uh, enormous things. If he has no, no uh, a political uh, party or movement behind him, he is not so important person. He is a symbol, uh, but not a, a such an important political agent. Solidarity movement is now, as I said, a Catholic uh, trade union of old uh, industrial uh, workers. So they are defending mainly 
the old factories, coal factories, for example, and this why they are on the Kaczynski side, and this why Kaczynski don't want to uh, close uh, coal mines because uh, his uh, voters are people from solidarity movement, and and uh, so they don't so they block the uh, ecological change in all Europe. And, uh, and um, the, the Catholicism, um, this, there is a paradox. Popiełuszko is not anymore so important because the knowledge of Polish youth about 80s and the solidarity movement is very, very restricted. Paradoxically, what they are taught ends with the Second World War. They, do, they are not thought about history of communism in Poland and the history of uh, solidarity movement, uh, uh, democratic opposition, and then a uh, period of transformation. So in their imaginary, uh, Catholic Church is much more connected with uh, 17th century uh, or 19th century and uh, uh, resistant against uh, Prussia and, uh, and, and Russia than with what happened in 80s in 20th century. And the second factor is that the Catholic Church is so conservative in Poland that uh, even for Poles it is too conservative. So it loses the influence. It was very influential during the 30 years and now we are witnessing and the socio sociological surveys show it very, and research show it very clearly. In the young generation, a, a decatholization, I would say. So young generation is, is not going to the church. And it is the uh, strongest uh, decatholization or dechristianization in whole Europe. Uh, so the difference between practice, religious practices of the older generation and of the younger generation is the biggest one in Europe. It is because we had a very active religious participation before, but uh, it means that the Catholic Church in Poland is in crisis, which will have consequences after five, ten years, but uh, not so much uh, now. And uh, I would like to um, um, uh, answer one thing Colin said about the bad situation we have faced to the powerful aliens of neoliberals and uh, radical conservative nationalists and all this stuff. I am thinking about the 19th century and the period after Vienna Congress and the power of the three empires which were connected in the secret alliance, Prussia, Russia, and Austro-Hungary, and were going everywhere when any democratic movement was appearing in Italy, in France, Russian army coming and crushing it. So, uh, or in Hungary or in Poland, I think they were in the worst situation that we are. So, and then we had all the uh, 1848 and the uh, uh, spring of uh, nations, and then we had uh, Marx writing Communist Manifesto and all the big uh, social democratic parties. In. So I think we are in a critical moment, in a pivotal moment, but we, in modern history of Europe, we had some such critical and pivotal moments. Um, yeah, so um, first on violence. Um, you know, all, already we have um, incredible amounts of state violence. Um, so is it likely that um, state violence will elicit violence from people who resist the state? Yes. You know, that's, I think that's just the way it is. It's, it's, it makes for a very um, uneven and difficult situation, but it would be, I think, completely naive to um, 
you know, presuppose nonviolence or to make nonviolence a kind of um, um, legitimating rule. Um, on the other question regarding um, how do we get out of this, um, or what would be the key ideas? Of course, I mean, first, if one thinks in terms of elections, there are going to be lots of specific, diff um, specific um, contextual, cultural, national things that make, you know, make generalization impossible. So I'm a little wary about that. But um, I would make I would just I would make one possibility, right? And, and the possibility uh, I started thinking about when Andre was talking about. Um, Poland, and it made me think. Right, so one of the things that y that unites the kind of of uh, unites peace and the other right wing forces is kind of we have a past, right? We Polish have this past, a strange medieval past, and that's who we are. And in fact, that's pretty common, right? The U.S. Um, Trump relies on this vision of the past. We have a past. Make America great again. I think Brexit's also similarly anchored in the we have a past. So uh, then, what would the um, progressive response would be? We have a future or you have a future. And I think there would be at least three components of this platform or this kind of thematic of we have a future or you have a de future depending. Um, climate, um, debt, and the generation. And I think that the climate issue invites people to participate in a really dramatic restructuring of society, a restructuring of economy um, that's quite, that gets rid of the kind of banal consumerism that globalized, um, you know, that global neoliberalism um, promised. It also gets rid of the banality of most service jobs, right? I mean, who gets inspired by being an insurance salesman? I don't think anybody, right? Finance is a miserable kind of job that only promises like, oh, you get to be, ha you get to have a lo lot of money. And so that becomes your whole motivating feature of your life. That's pathetic. So I think that a kind of vision of that where climate is the first pillar of the future that we have invites people to participate in something that's really empowering and meaningful, right? The, the survival of the planet. The, set, the second one, debt, um, I'm not sure how much that applies here, but it definitely applies in Greece, definitely applies in other parts of uh, Southern Europe, and it applies a lot in the United States, um, particularly for younger people um, with trillions of dollars of generational debt because of education. But I think debt as a, the kind of abolition of debts is a feature that makes a difference. And then I would say to think about the generations that was thinking about the youth, but it also brings in feminist politics um, and politics around gender. I mean, it surprises me, but young people want to talk about gender all the time, right? They want to talk about non-binary, questions, they want to talk about ways of transgressing gender boundaries, they want to talk about all sorts of experiments in life that don't, are not restricted to the forms of masculinity and femininity and heteronormativity that they feel so constrained by. So a promise around a future of generations that opens that up I think can also be um, um, powerful and for, in some countries it really addresses the far right and the Catholic Church, right from France and in Spain where a gender politics has been a really strong mobilizing um, feature on the right. So this um, third idea of generation um, I think can address that. So that would be my, my suggestion. Yeah, uh, not so different. Uh, I, I, I'm upset that I've become that I've been pessimistic because I've been writing recently that what really characterizes the movements that we call right-wing populist is that they are rooted in a politicized pessimistic nostalgia. That these are forces that that they 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 they, they address people saying, look life is, is getting narrower for you, it's getting more difficult, the world's getting more difficult, uh, and it's because there's a load of outsiders are threatening a space that should be yours. Women won't keep their place, there are, two, there are immigrants. Our country's forced to have alliances with other countries. Um, uh, people go on about climate change when, when they're just trying to stop us having more stuff. So if we fight against all these things, uh, and that, that bring the, and the, the, the xenophobia stands out as the most striking element. But if you poke any of those movements, you will find uh, 
uh, anti-climate change, uh, climate change denial, anti-feminism, uh, as well as, as, as the, uh, uh, also anti-young, quite often actually, well, these are movements of the old. Uh, now, people who are who's expressing their dissatisfaction with life in that way will, <clears throat> will never embrace progressive causes because they, they will say, no, we've got to make the world narrower. Uh, and this it goes across quite a few social classes. I mean, we often think of just the, the sort of rust belt ex-industrial, ex-mining workers, but it, it applies to quite a lot of, of prosperous middle class people as well who feel their particular world is passing away. And so I agree here at this level, at this point, I agree with Jody, uh, that there, there have to be positive possibilities seen. So you, as well as alerting people to the threats of climate change. We also talk about green technologies and the possibility of a greening economy and how actually uh, an economy that's making the world more climate sensitive will actually be a progressive future. Uh, it means ap appealing to the young and to the educated. Uh, it, there, there is definitely a gender war component in this. Uh, it, which it doesn't necessarily set men against women, but it, there's women and, and men who sympathize with women, and there's men, <laughs> masculist causes, with which a lot of women sympathize. But there's definitely a kind of regressive and potentially violent masculism uh, is a major enemy. Uh, and it's negative, it's backward looking, it's just resenting the intrusion of women into life. The, the, uh, the, the pro-feminist vision, which men can join as well, says that there are opportunities for more and more people. And the more, op here, here in a way, the, the classical economists have an important point. If you make the world bigger, if you make the labor force bigger, you make more stuff. I, I know Jody doesn't want stuff, but you make more stuff, you provide more services for each other, and actually society can get better. Uh, so I think th there is a need for an optimistic vision. Um, mine wouldn't require a revolution, as Jodis does. Um, but the, the, it, 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 if, if the left, I, I've been warning some of my, because Germans are very pessimistic people, I've been warning a lot of my German friends in recent years, if you go down this totally negative view of potential possibilities, you will end up on the far right, because that's the only home for pessimism. Um, so I take the last round of questions. Yeah, Boris. Yeah, the microphone is only one. Uh, thank you, Boris Buden. Um, I have a simple uh, question uh, to ask ev everyone. Do you still see any positive progressive use of the notion of internationalism? Or internationalism has been finally appropriated by the right wing, I would say racist, so that we are now can already talk about right wing uh, internationalism in, in terms of uh, promising uh, radical changes so that the slogan would be now you know racist of all the countries unite you have nothing to lose except your liberal <laughs> multicultural chains so, so my question is do you see any way to save this old weapon strong weapon think of think of uh, the concept of People's Front, et cetera, anti-fascism, et cetera. Um, there's one other gentleman at the back, oh, yeah. if you could introduce yourself as well. Yeah, um, my name's Dan Swain. I had a question which is, um, so taking Colin's framing of, you know, the, the, the enemies are an alliance of the neoliberals and the xenophobic right, doesn't that raise an important question about to what extent we should, and it sort of speaks, I think, to Jody's point about, an in, about a, a party, to what extent shouldn't we be quite worried, therefore, about allying with the neoliberal bit of it against the, the far right bit of it? So I'm thinking, you know, questions of to what extent do we worry about the role, you know, but I, I think especially in kind of Colin's formulation of a broad range of different forces, but then when you, I'm thinking of people like, the Liberal Democrats in the UK, Macron, uh, the the right of the Democratic Party, civic platform in Poland, you know the 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 neoliberal wings who might at this very moment be enemies of the far right, but if the broader sweep is is that alliance, how does how do 
how do we negotiate those kinds of potential alliances or, or not? Okay, so we have two questions for the panel and let's take this as the round off or round up of our discussion today. So I would also like to invite the speakers to kind of reflect uh, on the overall topic or the theme of the panel. Um, well, I'll, I'll start with the questions and then if, because um, <laughs> I was thinking about those and not the overall theme. So, um, um, Boris, I think absolutely yes for internationalism. That's the only way to deal with um, the climate crisis. Um, it's also the only way to dismantle the capitalist economy that enables the, um, or that protects the oil and gas sector. And so I think that, um, or in, you know, the whole carbon economy. So I think that it has to be internationalist. And then I also think that that's also one of the ongoing appeals of, of communism, right? Particularly from the Yugoslav um, e experience and example and the way that Yugoslavia um, led the non-aligned movement. I mean, that's a really important resource because it's a resource that looks at global struggle across a variety of different places, global anti-colonial, decolonial struggle. So I think yes, um, um, internationalism. And then I think this ties with the, um, the second question. Um, like, I wouldn't agree that I wouldn't call the enemy um, what uh, neoliberalism and the far right. I'd call the enemy, you know, capitalist imperialism, and I would say that the answer then for de, you know for um, is for addressing imperialism has got to be a international, global, and I'll go, you know, I know it's not a popular word here, communist movement. And that we have to recognize that the problem is capitalism. And it's the, the reason that, that social democracy um, has been so weak is that it keeps saying that you can have capitalism with a human face. That doesn't work. It's anchored in exploitation. It's, I mean, you, earlier um, when you were mentioning varieties of, 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 of capitalism, you also mentioned Thailand. Thailand has slavery, right? We've got the slave economy that's directly part of the production of global consumer goods. It's, there was recently um, a number of uh, big corporations in the US um, in combination with um, Amnesty International acknowledged the existence of child slave labor, slave coerced slave labor in the global supply chain for their consumer goods. So um, back to the answer. So I would think that, that we can't kind of soft pedal this. Um, particularly under the conditions of climate change. I mean, it's no wonder that that um, particularly folks in the global south, why they wouldn't trust the global north, right? Because of col um, colonialism and, expo and ongoing exploitation in the capitalist system. There's a good reason that workers in the global north don't trust um, liberal elites, right? It's their ongoing immiseration. So um, the, um, we have to think of the enemy as capitalist and we have to think of the enemy as imperialist, which means that uh, for a large um, start, the, the, the US is pretty much the enemy too. <laughs> So for the first question, uh, God sei Dank, uh, fascists don't like the word internationals and they don't use it. Maybe they are practicing it, but they don't use it. So we can use it again and I think yes, we should. Uh, I mean that, and I agree here uh, with Jody, that uh, the only response which can be politically strong enough is not only on the level of local or even national left movements, but on an international movement who would be comparable in some way to the force of the corporational capitalism. And in this sense, uh, yes, internationals, but uh, I think also that uh, in 19th century, when the idea of internationals w w was uh, forged, uh, the very important thing was the future, the ideal of the future of equality of men and, uh, and women. And, uh, and uh, I think that the problem, and Jody told about this, is that we don't have uh, we have the same ideal, but it is not, I would say, modernized. It is not contemporary ideal of the future. And uh, without such an ideal, I think no universalistic ideal can be f built or 
no universalistic political movement can rebuild. So uh, uh, I would say first thing to do, we have to think. We have to think about the contemporary way to express this future or, or we have to reinvent future in our way because otherwise we are fighting against retrotopias as Zygmunt Bauman uh, called it. And uh, as to the uh, middle class here, I, uh, uh, or neoliberals, it is not an uh, accident that I used the, 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 the word uh, middle class. I think uh, middle class is the swinger of political systems. It means that it can be allied to very reactionary and fascist, in matter of fact, forces, and this was the case of 30s. And it can be ally of uh, workers' movements and uh, emancipatory movements. And it was the case of the golden 30s after the war. And, uh, and I think that, that uh, at least in the particular situation of Poland today, there is no possibility to change internal politics in Poland without an alliance of middle class and its political representatives and uh, the, um, the progressive uh, working class political representatives. Without this, we will not change uh, the, the political situation in Poland. And I don't think it is uh, only in Poland the case. I think it is the, the problem in many North, uh, global North countries that uh, now middle class, as you said, uh, are joining the, the, the reactionary forces, but maybe it will see at the moment the, the, the possibility um, of, of joining, let's say, progressive uh, forces. But for this, we are coming to the point one, we have to reinvent future. Yes, we have to be internationalist. Um, if, if I'm right in saying that one of the problems we have is, is that the levels at which economic, major economic decisions are made are going right up towards the global level. Our democracy stays uh, at the national level. There's only one way, there's only two ways you can save democracy. Uh, one is by retreating into the nation state, putting up protectionist barriers, reducing trade, re uh, generally getting into a hostile relationship with your neighbors. That was the remedy of the fascist movements of, of, of the 1920s and 30s. Um, and it, it's the language Donald Trump talks now as well. Uh, it, 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 only, it only leads to increased animosity, to reduced prosperity and the risk of war. So the, you have to move up. You have to move up to international levels. And, and in Europe, we, or you, I have to say now, have, uh, weak though it may be, the most democratic international network the world's ever produced uh, in the European Union. It's the only thing likely ever to bring together progressive forces. No, none of the other world groupings have got anything like its degree of, of, of democracy and, and civil society about them. Uh, grow it, fight for it, uh, force it back into a progressive path. Um, that's the only hope. Um, and th th then coming on, that, that leads in a way onto this issue of yes, the, the, the neoliberals, well, in a way, neoliberals and what do I call them, pessimistic uh, populists, uh, are both divided about their relationship to each other. Uh, there are neoliberals who have understood how uh, the, the nationalist agenda can, can keep democracy at that level where it can never reach. And this is very much part of what Brexit's about, and it, it's about, and it's what you know, Trump is about. Um, but there are also neoliberals who uh, really want to save their global project and who realize that a, a world of retreating into protectionist islands is actually a less prosperous world and they, the business makes less money. Uh, so that, they're very, 
neoliberals are very, very divided about their attitude to the xenophobic movements. Um, and also the, the, the xenophobic movements, it's interesting, some of them are very neoliberal. I mean, I would say that um, Orban in, 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 it, in Hungary is a very neoliberal regime, that the role of uh, Salvini while he was in government uh, in Italy was, was very, very neoliberal, very uh, anti-redistribution. Uh, then you've also got some sort of social, social fascists. Sort of. And actually, I think the Polish government is rather like that. And so would Marine Le Pen if she got into power. And so are the Danish far right. So, so, um, and in a way, there's a systematic ambiguity on this issue of neoliberalism versus some sort of welfare regime in both Donald Trump and Boris Johnson. Because both, I think they are just people who live in total contradiction, actually. Uh, but they both promise low taxes uh, 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 but, 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 uh, and um, uh, a deregulated regime, whereas Johnson pr uh, promises enormous public spending and Trump promises protectionism uh, for, for, for old industries. So both these forces are very divided internally and, and they are both first very, very dangerous allies to have. So um, there may be some neoliberals might say in order to save our project, we need to make concessions. We need to accept public spending. We need to, we need to accept high taxation. They, 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 capitalism done this before, after all, in the 19th, after the Second World War, capitalism, Western capitalism did that. But the, the great advantage capitalism has is its ability to change and, and morph into, into, into different forms. And the, the state socialist system once it received one big blow in 1989, it all collapsed to the ground. Capitalism has gone through crises. It, goes, it changes its shape. It has crises. It recovers from crises. And I think it will probably do so again. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank the panelists for a fantastic uh, debate. Very intriguing, exciting uh, comments. And my pers I, I personally was very happy. Uh, about how the, the thing went and um, a round of applause for our speakers.